Actually, tab three will be the narratives and then eight for line item. That's what you want to go to. Yes, So I think we're ready, Sean, in spite of the light. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a little after 5.30, and uh, we'll go ahead and start uh, tonight's meeting. Tonight is the uh, Scarborough Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. It's Wednesday, April 24th. I want to welcome everyone to Chambers A. Um, we expect the meeting to go on to um, hopefully no later than 8 p.m., uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to actually review municipal budgets. Uh, at our last meeting, we reviewed the uh, Department of Education. Um, on tonight's uh, purview or scope is the Fire and EMS Department, the Police Department, and Community Services. Um, and then what's not listed on the agenda is that there will be a discussion at the end by the town manager about uh, priorities um, regarding <coughs> policy initiatives um, that we, um, as a town council, uh, Finance Committee had kind of directed the, uh, the manager to include what the impact of those are and then um, also to discuss uh, what other budgets within the municipal side that we might want to review, if any at all, and then what is our next steps. Um, so I do want to recognize that for the purposes of uh, calling to order is that we do have all members of the Council's Finance Committee here. Uh, we also have uh, staff and the town manager, and the manager will go through introductions. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to mention, as far as from a process perspective, uh, so that people are aware, including some guests outside of staff, is that um, at the conclusion of the presentation, we will have question and answers by the council's uh, finance committee members. Um, you know, a question, dialogue, and conversation. Um, at the conclusion of that, we will also have public comment, and the public comment is an opportunity for anyone that's here. <coughs> Um, particularly, we do have guests that are also town councilors, and if they wish to uh, address as a citizen any questions or comments that they would um, have for us to consider from a um, budgetary perspective, I would ask that they uh, present those questions first so that they can be answered, and if there's any personal comments, that they reserve those to the end, um, because those are statements and not necessarily something that we can address or spe um, specifically uh, account for. So. Um, and then we'll have just general public comments because we do have some citizens here as well. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to the town manager for introductions sure. and uh, the process uh, starting. Terrific. Um, you certainly recognize Chief Thurlow. Uh, he has uh, two new folks on his staff. Uh, you may have met Deputy Chief Lemoria last year, but uh, we have a new face here, and I'll let him do the introductions. Good evening. So this is Rich Kindlin. Uh Rich came on uh, earlier this year and uh, is doing a admirable job of trying to fill Tony Atato's boots. Welcome aboard. After his retirement. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so Mike, the, show, the floor is yours. The floor is yours, sir. Well, once again, we appreciate the opportunity to defend our budget tonight. Um, I didn't prepare a ton of information, not knowing exactly what you wanted to, to go through, but I'll, I'll give you a quick overview, and then certainly we're here to answer your questions most uh, importantly. The department-wide increase across all five of the fire department's budget is uh, just over 220000 or about a 4.3% increase. The vast majority of that are <clears throat> is in wage and benefit lines um, due to the COLA increases, the merit and contractual, contractual step increases in our collective bargaining agreements. Um, that the uh, wage and benefit lines does include an $85,000 cost for new lieutenants or for new positions to be implemented in um, April and I'll speak to those a little bit later on when I talk about the staffing plan because we have done a major update to that plan. Uh, in terms of the other expenses in our operational lines, uh, supplies increased approximately $25,000 or about a 12.9 percent increase. Those were primarily due to the increased cost of utilities um, including the cost of opening the new facility uh, in the fourth quarter of next year, we had to um, project what the additional electrical cost and some of the other utility costs are for that new facility, which will be coming on as the tail end of this budget. And we did have a significant increase in fuel um, cost per gallon this year, um, which is factored into that supply increase. Finally, the, the third uh, driver within our operational budgets is a little bit of over $10,000 in property and, and new equipment. 
uh, that is a decrease of about 35 percent, and most of that was due to um, reducing some new equipment that we had uh, forecast to, to purchase in lieu of trying to find the money for the new positions that we have proposed and to meet the manager's um, cuts that we needed to come up with to meet his initial budget goals. So there's actually a $10,000 reduction in property and new equipment that we're looking at. In terms of our revenues, uh, that's where the really good news is in our budget. We were, uh, once again, as part of our staffing plan, we always look very carefully at our, our revenues. And we were able to increase the EMS billing revenues by $250,000 this year, which is a 21.6% increase. Um, we went just as deep as we could because this was the year after two years of not making any progress on our staffing plan that we had hoped that that was going to advance, and we certainly wanted to soften that blow as much as possible. Um, the manager uh, gladly took that $250,000 in revenue and then cut the positions <laughs> that we had hoped to offset that with, but that's part of how the process works. Um, that revenue increase came from um, the fact that Comstar, our third-party billing agent, uh, has some new software. They're using a new clearinghouse. We're, we're doing a little bit better with our collections. Um, it helps maximize the uh, insurance proceeds we get from vehicle accidents. Um, and we also, uh, you may remember, uh, brought on a part-time billing clerk uh, with a few hours each week, and that clerk has been able to follow up on some of the claims that Comstar isn't having any luck with, with some personal one-on-one -on -one phone calls and some added effort that has really shown some, some positive progress. We fire and exceed pay for the, the uh, time that she's putting in and, and additional revenues that are collected. So all that together um, netted a, an increase in operational revenues of $250,000. So on a net basis, if you take those revenues uh, from the uh, increase in our operating budget, this, the fire department is actually at a $22,000 less uh, expenses this year than last, or about a 0.5% uh, reduction in our overall budget. Any questions on any of those things, or did you want to roll into CIP, or did you want me to start on the staffing plan I, piece? I would rather take each part separate, if that's okay with everyone. Um, any questions? Oh, I'll ask them. Go ahead. Scott? Two quick, well, some of the questions. One, on the revenue piece, that's great. But I know last time we had a conversation about the billing rate itself and whether there was some adjustments you could make for Medicare. Was that part of the 252 that you... <clears throat> So did we adjust the rates? Is that yeah, the question? Because we had that conversation last year. So is that part of the 250 or is that still an opportunity to... No, that is part of the 250. What, what we have, what the current fee schedule and uh, that's been adopted is, is that we adjust our rates based on what the Medicare rates adjust annually. So every January when those rates go up, and I can't remember, I think it was 2.1 or something yeah. like that so this year, kind of we, we index automatically when those changes happen. Is that just for Medicare? Is that for private pay patients too, or is it, that different? It's rates? the same. No, we have to charge the same rate for everybody. We can't bill separate for Medicare than we do private pays. Geez, I wish hospitals had that same. <laughs> but that, that's a regulation that you can't. You can't have that's my understanding of this. The uh, federal regulations. That's right. Um, the other question I had. Um, really about wages and benefits, you have a line here that said it increased cost of some benefit lines. And then we had talked last time you made a lot of changes in sort of how the health care benefits are constructed. You thought it was going to save money. Are we actually saying it's not driving the, the savings that we thought? No, we realized the savings that we we did. That that insurance certainly oh, okay. slowed down the increases. The the uh, One of the drivers for why those percent increases might look a little bit higher than the cost of living adjustments is that it's just the way the, the cycle works. We promoted, we created four new lieutenant positions three years ago, and in this fiscal year they meet their first step increase, so there's four officer level positions that all end up getting a cost of living increase plus a step increase the way that they're, they're uh, it's, it's different than the municipal employees who now are on a a program where you get a small incremental step every year on top of COLA. With the unions, we're still at a hard step every three years on average. And this happens to be a year where we take a hit on some of our more higher paid individuals because of where they are in that process. 
So, and then, and then I, leading into that, so in your pull list, you had new position requests for four lieutenants to replace four per year. And that, so the net, what is the net difference in cost, and, and why is that the lieutenant, if it's per diem? So can you talk a little bit about the structure and why lieutenants and sure. what that cost differential is to replace four per diems or four full time? And I understand it's going in place in April for 85K, but that means next year there'll be a, an automatic bump to the budget of about 255. So. Is there a way to stagger these that we could do two this year, two next year? Or, so look at that whole sort of concept would just be helpful. Sure. So the way the process started, when I put my budget together, I did it based on the staffing plan that we have uh, instituted back in 2006 and have updated multiple times since. This year we did another major revision that's posted to the website, uh, the budget portal. There's a, a, uh, an overview, and which really kind of boils it down to about a four-page document. And then there's the full plan that's got all the backup and data that goes with it. The plan calls for four a year. And I know that's aggressive, but it's based on the fact that it takes four bodies to fill one seat on the 24-7 rotation shift. And so that's what my original request that went into the manager was, along with the $250,000 of revenue to help offset that. The manager wasn't able to support that at the beginning, and we made we took those positions out. But I was able to advocate for the fact that this year in particular, after two years of not making any progress on the plan over the last two fiscal years, because when we open the new facility, it gives us the opportunity to bring in some part-time folks and to reorganize some of our full-time staff from Dunstan to here. The Oak Hill Station is by far the busiest district. Uh, it, the calls triple what any of the other stations do. And now that we're going to have the space to bring our second ambulance, uh, it's actually our third ambulance, from Dunstan to here, along with a pool position, a full-time position, we've brought a per diem position up from Black Point, and we're hoping to have some, uh, now that we have the room for it, we're going to bring in some more students. So we're going to have more people in the new facility. Not that we're investing in new positions, but we're bringing them from other places now that we have the room to house them. And this position is terribly critical because we need somebody to orchestrate the day-to-day -day operations of who goes on what apparatus, what apparatus goes to what calls. Part of this whole reorganization, and I know we don't have a ton of time tonight to get into the details, involves providing our services more efficiently. Right now we have two ambulance crews that have a paramedic on each. Hiring paramedics, hiring full-time firefighters, period, has really turned into quite a challenge. Uh, the market is extremely tight. The candidate pools, we used to get 30 to 50 candidates in any application period. It's a fraction of that now, and all of our peers are facing the same issue. Um, we can't hire the number of paramedics to do business the way we have. And what we're trying to do, and, and part of our long-range plan, is to more efficiently run our EMS calls based on the emergency medical dispatch protocols that we have in place through our dispatch center and take those lower acuity calls where a basic life support trained basic EMT or an advanced EMT can take those calls and those volumes and leave the paramedic uh, for the more serious calls. All that is predicated on having somebody on the floor with that crew, uh, they'll be supervising uh, up to 11 people in that building uh, to be able to make those decisions and make sure that we're operating the way we need to. So the moral of the story is I was able to go back to the manager and, and advocate that we really need to try to find a way to, to get these positions in when the building opens in, in the last quarter of next fiscal year. He allowed me to come forward with a proposal that did so, but only if I did it within the budget number that he had got me down to with his first round of reductions. And what I was able to do to come up with, a, it is an $85,000 cost to, to do that uh, in that fourth quarter. I was able to do that by reducing the per diem hour, a, a similar number of per diem hours as those folks are going to cover for that fourth quarter. So I'm essentially swapping a part-time employee for a full-time employee. We're not um, adding to the, the full-time equivalents or the number of hours of coverage, but I have got somebody that is going to be a full-time officer that can 
do the job that it needs to be done. In addition to cutting those per diem hours, I had to find another 50,000 give or take dollars of additional cuts. That's where the new equipment and some of those other lines uh, had to sacrifice to be able to come up with the full $85,000. So if the moral of the story is if you cut the full-time positions, there's only about thirty, thirty-two thousand dollars in net savings because I would have to put the per diem I was back in, plus there are some of those other um, cuts that I've made to call for staffing and some other things uh, that would need to go back in. But what about the second part of the question about what I'm looking forward to too, if it's eighty five this year, but the full load next year, if that's that's gonna look like a there'll be a budget issue for us next year. There will be a challenge next year and what and about the prospect of doing two and then two later in the next budget cycle. Is that, is that workable with per diems or are you saying it's not workable? It's not workable because these are full-time positions and to get that around the clock. The, the, the idea of staggering is a tactic that we have used in the past that has worked efficiently. So instead of hiring four for the full year, we've brought four in in January and then not made a request in the forthcoming year and picked up that additional cost. So we essentially are we're fulfilling the plan over two years instead of one. This year we're, we're essentially asking to do the same thing. I, I have promised I won't come back and ask for any more full-time people next year. We'll simply pick up the cost that are stranded from this year for these people. And, and do appreciate this timing uh, isn't really budget related. It's really space related. We don't have space to have these people until we're in that building. So uh, it, it does have a budget implication, but that's not the driving reason so, behind so it. The building got delayed. Does, I mean, based on that, would that delay this? It would, because I physically okay. wouldn't have the space to put them. Okay, thank you. Um, Chief, on, on the staffing plan, can you, can you kind of cover the calls for service and um, kind of the history of the demands for the services and uh, what we're kind of experiencing as a town? and. And then um, not just uh, historically up until 2018, but also maybe um, what you're trying to plan for as far as the future. I think that uh, the document you provided tells a story that needs to be understood. Well, it really does, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that. And I, I really hope that we're able to, in, in workshop session, um, put a full presentation on and, and spend some time on this. It is very complicated. Uh, I understand that. But there, there are there's a ton of work and effort that's gone in to uh, explain where we're at where we've come from and, and where we see the future. Um, one of the glaring things that when you look at the staffing plan, uh, which once again is available on the, the budget portal, is the cost for service increase from, and we've used from 1980 to 2018, the calls went from less than 1,000 up to over 4,000 calls per year. Well, at the same time and during the same period, the total call members that we have available to help mitigate those situations went from 318 down to less than 100 now. We're down around 87. <clears throat> Over the past 25 years, from 1993 through 2018, our calls for service have increased 4% annually on average. So we took the actual calls, we went backwards 25 years, took the average, and then we've projected what that's going to look like going forward. So in 2023, five years from today, will be going to over 5,000 calls and in 10 years over 6,300 calls. If the growth in our community stayed the same as it has over the past 25 years, and we all know that we've just approved a huge project in Scarborough Downs um, and that the growth in our community over these last couple of years and for the next couple of years with things that are already on the books far exceeds that 4% growth. I mean, we're talking uh, in the SEDCO um, analysis they did for the Scarborough Down project alone, a population increase of 15 percent, housing unit increase of 19 percent, and commercial square footage of, of 20 percent increase over what we have in our community now over the next 10 years. None of those, none of that growth is calculated into those projections that we have done. We only look backwards with the typical growth that we have experienced. So there's some real challenges coming, and, and I've said right along that this plan is intended to be a, a proactive plan. I don't want to come here uh, in an emergency and say, you know, something bad has happened or something bad is going to happen. We're trying to paint the, um, 
the situation that we're in. We're trying to be realistic about it, and we're trying to, to come forward with a plan that can be um, instituted over a period of time to get us where we need to be. There's also a section in the plan that, that I think does a real good job of looking at 13 different cohort departments that are very similar in uh, geography and, and makeup to ours. We tried to pick departments that were of similar um, call volumes and, and similar makeups. And uh, I think it's, it's really telling when you look at those. Scarborough is very uh, near the average in terms of the number of calls that we respond to. Um, we have to staff, because of our geography, almost uh, over twice as many stations. We staff six um, because of the marsh and the way our town is, is geographically uh, set up versus the average of 2.4. And we certainly protect a significantly higher property valuation than, than our peer cohort departments. All at the same time, we're doing it with uh, just over half as many full-time staff. Uh, so when you, you really dig in and look at the statistics and, and look at uh, how we've worked over the years to implement per diem programs and, and uh, the student program to help bolster our, our uh, call force, um, it really is all driven by the call for us. We, have, we are in the same boat that uh, departments are nationally, and you can pick up a newspaper or a, a fire service periodically, and, periodical and, and read about it anytime because that's all everybody is talking about. It's a nationwide issue. Uh, I think Scabro has, has certainly done their share in the partnerships we've developed with the community college, the student living program, uh, our per diem program, and the work that we've done to try to keep the call force as active as we can because it is, uh, they're, they're trained folks, they do a great job, and they really provide a tremendous service. The problem is we don't have the numbers that we used to. And when they were there, they filled that gap. Now we just don't have that many of them that are available when we need them for those critical calls that require that type of manpower. Just as a follow-up, uh, two questions. One is, um, can you highlight, even though you kind of alluded to it, can you <coughs> highlight, because I remember back in 2006, I was actually on the council before, uh, at that time, you started this uh, strategic planning process, and can you kind of just on a high level explain to the community, because there's a lot of new people in town, what you've gone through in this planning and what the delays have um, that you've inc uh, encountered as part of implementing this? Because your plan is a directive of the town council that at least in 2006 said what they wanted. Can you kind of give us a... Yeah, that, that's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, the plan has held steady at, at the request of four per year, and, and it has been a number of years. I, I, I need to point out, the town council has been very supportive, and there are years when we've made uh, great progress. They've given us everything we did. There was one year they gave us six positions. Uh, we got four new offices and, and uh, I mean, two offices and, and four new people in one fiscal year. And there's been other years when there's been other priorities and, and we haven't made any progress. But we have, over that period of time, uh, with your help and your predecessors, uh, made significant progress. We are behind where we had hoped to be. Um, we still are faced with the challenges that I've outlined in the plan. Um, and sometimes we're our worst enemy because we get it done. Yeah. And, and so far, we've been able to get it done. We certainly. Um, it's getting harder every year to do it when you have the significant incidents and you just don't have those bodies there. Uh, we, we have a great mutual aid uh, set up. We use our neighbors all the time, and, and they reciprocate with us. Um, but we need to continue to make progress. So the last question I have before turning it back up. Um, so if we are able to meet all of your expectations and needs that you've presented in the budget, where are you in that overall original plan? Are you at 50 percent? Are you back on track? Are you still behind? No, we're still behind. I mean, we, we, we're about, I don't know that I've got it right in front of me, but we're probably a little over half of what, if we had stuck to the plan each year yeah. and been able to do that, we're probably halfway where we would be, I think. Yeah, I was trying to find myself. The, you had a chart that showed how many we were actually been able to I bring did, on. And it's 22, and I took it as I recall, yeah. something like that. And I think the plan, had we stuck to it, it would have been nearly double that. Yeah. If you can say that, sorry. I'm a, uh, so it's been 12 years since the original plan. 
So um, would we have completed the plan by now if we stuck to the original? Um, and you're saying we're now halfway through, or would we be at? We would be close if we had, if we had been able to fund all no, each we year. We would have been close to where we are. Okay. So we're at fifty percent of plan. Okay. Roughly. <coughs> Roughly. Plus one, yeah, of course. Yeah. No one predicted the Great Recession, so Absolutely. 2008 yeah. through 10, 11 was, yeah, two years was ten, really challenging. Two years right Correct. For everyone. We went through some really tough years there. Okay. So what is our, what is our headcount now in fire and EMS? What's your total full-time staff? Full-time staff, we're at 32. So okay. in all the materials here, I don't know what I didn't find the paper, but there, and I've noticed this in, in other presentations, but, you know, Having uh, headcount uh, figures readily available would be great. I know you've got it here in a little box, but but I'm really struck by the fact that you're talking about being 50% of where you'd like to be according to plan. Why why the big ask now? Why did we, you make a similar ask last year or prior years? So it just seems like we've had pent up a pent up <coughs> gap between service demand and staffing. So why are we getting the you know, a big, you know, a big request now. I believe the uh, the personnel counts are in the budget because that was one of the things. So in the, that's right at the top of the, the page. Yeah, I so see that. all those are there, <coughs> and the ask has been the same for me since right. 2006. When that when the first plan came out, the ask has been four per Still year. Four. The same four. Now it hasn't gotten to you some of those years because it was cut, or you know, in the last two years when we were dealing with the whole state revenue for schools and all those issues, it was clear up front: don't bother asking, and and we didn't. But that doesn't mean that we haven't had the conversations and that I haven't advocated for our plan each and every year since I developed it in 2006. That's helpful, Chief, thank you. Uh, and um, as I'm you know, looking at the drivers here, you, you've, done, you've done a nice job of explaining you know, what's happened, that calls have increased and your ability to, you know, to staff has been uh, a problem. Um, uh, you're, you know, you're, your total call members has has declined, but what what is the? Can you tell me what the fully loaded cost is for one lieutenant annualized? You know, the estimate for wages and a factor for benefits plus plus vehicles. I don't know about the vehicle, but the fully loaded cost for a lieutenant we have. So essentially, it's that eighty-five thousand dollars times four. So each of them are eighty-five each, wage each and benefit, yeah. right? And that would include a factor of say what thirty percent or something. That uh, includes their FICA, uh, their, their, their all their benefit line uh, includes are something. included, uh, uniforms. Okay. So and that that is a fully loaded number. Overtime, overtime, overtime is time off. Yep. That sort of thing. Okay. Um, the other, the other question I had is that um, uh, I'm, and you said the vehicles. It's not not clear. These these asked. folks are on an apparatus, so they would not. They don't have a take home vehicle or anything like that. They would be riding but, on. But will lieutenants get a vehicle? No. They don't get a vehicle. No. They are part of the crew on the floor. They would go in the ladder truck or the engine or the ambulance, depending on the call and where they're needed. And then maybe you could also help me with what, what are the job classifications that maybe if I had a, a contract, I could probably see this, you know, in the collective bargaining agreement pretty easily. But what, what is an entry level position uh, in the fire department? Firefighter EMT. Okay. And then what are the other classifications? So it goes from firefighter EMT to firefighter advanced EMT. It's, a, it's an EMS license level and firefighter paramedic. And then there's a lieutenant's position and a captain's position. So we're bringing people into the, you know, the fourth step of five, five classifications, if, if I have that right. So what is the rationale for that, particularly you know, given the, the fact that it does <coughs> sound like you're having a hard time getting people even at an entry level where mm -hmm. you, you want to allow some time for training. Why, why are we staffing at that level, at the fourth, the next to the highest level? Uh, in terms of the initial ask. And perhaps I can get Jerry to pass these out. This is a uh, slide that we will use in our uh, presentation when we're able to workshop on the staffing plan. But this talks about what the responsibilities are of those lieutenants. So 
it isn't like that we're going out and hiring a lieutenant from outside. We will be promoting from within, from the folks that have come up through the ranks and have served and, and done well in the program through a promotional process. The position is created specifically for this building for the responsibilities that, that we need to have done in this new facility. We've got that many more staff that we're going to be able to bring here. And this, is, this officer's position is the lowest level of supervision for the day-to-day firefighters that are getting the work done. And this one in particular is, is critical because of the number of folks, the number of apparatus that we're going to have here to make those split-second decisions when the call comes in, you two are going to take this truck and go to that call. And so that just, you can't pre-program all that stuff in advance. So, and I understand, I know there's a lot of complexities with staffing and your schedules and how many positions it takes to, to actually staff one full position. But if we're staffing at a higher level like that, uh, is there another way we should be calculating the effect, you know, the real cost of this? I mean, if you're going to be promoting people from within, uh, and hiring people at an entry level. Uh, I mean, you're really not hiring, as you just said, you're not hiring directly into a lieutenant role. You're going to be promoting people from within. But the, the person that's the right a, figures uh, for calculating this. So your question's valid. We're, we're making promotions, and those new, the current employees in their new positions will be paid at the lieutenant's rate. So that's what the numbers are predicated on. We will be backfilling once we make those promotions, then yes, we will have to hire some more people at the lower end of the scale. But we've, we've, <clears throat> we've accounted for that differential when we put these numbers together. Okay. Um, Is it fair to say that you do not exceed that budgetary? Absolutely. Okay. It's a hard number. No matter how you add up, you do not exceed the $85,000. Correct. But when we make the promotions, we're paying right. those I folks at that rate. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. So I mean, the only thing I'd say, Chief, I mean, I, you've been uh, doing a terrific job, uh, I think, with a lot of pressure uh, in terms of staffing and a lot of other demands. Uh, um, um, so, uh, you know, we appreciate the effort and your, you know, your presentation is really quite clear. The thing that I'm still struggling with is what's the real driver here, if, uh, you know, in terms of the... You know, what's driving the number of calls? I mean, one would assume as fire safety gets more proficient that there ought to be fewer calls, that there ought to be um, better methods, that there ought to be fewer fires. So what am I missing as I look at these figures? Aren't we, you know, generally getting safer in terms of our methods and our techniques? And shouldn't that be shown somewhere in terms of efficiencies? So there are less structural fires that we used to have when I joined back in the 70s. That, that, that's a fact. Uh, we've done a great job with fire prevention, with smoke detection. Uh, one of the things that I hope to bring to you before too long is a sprinkler ordinance similar to what Gorham did that's uh, a, a really important step that we need to take in our, our process. What's driving it, Don, is EMS. It's emergency medical services. Um, similar to how some of the big box stores impact uh, the police department, some of the medical facilities that we have in town and, and some of the long-term term, long -term care facilities in town are a demand on our services. Now, some of that's offset by revenues from, from Medicare and other things, but that is what's driving our calls for services, no doubt about it. 75% of what we do is, is emergency medical services. That doesn't mean that we don't, approximately 75% of what we do is emergency medical type responses. That doesn't mean we, we don't have to be prepared to deal with the structure fires, even though there are fewer of them. They're much more manpower <coughs> intensive and apparatus intensive. Yeah, I'm sure a demographic will probably yeah. drive it for them. But, but, but yeah. in, Chief, if you don't mind, I think it's important to also explain that with an EMS call, there's also other responsibilities that go along with that in the sense that you're not just getting an ambulance with an EMT or a paramedic or firefighter. Paramedic. Mm -hmm. You're also getting a police officer who will need to respond because you don't know the circumstances in which you had the accident. And sometimes you might even need the fire truck as well, correct? And we do. For the serious EMS calls, we, right. we always send the neighborhood station so that the care gets to them as quickly as possible. That's why we continue to staff all six of our stations to make mm -hmm. sure that the person that lives next door to Pleasant Hill Station has the same access to the AED and somebody to get it to them when they're having a heart attack, as the guy that lives next door to the kill station. And the general expectation of any community, it doesn't matter where you live, is that you're there now, 
<laughs> it's not five minutes. It's, um, you know, they want you now because it's serious enough. And so there's always that available, having that available. And I'm hearing um, at, the, at the legislature and before my committee about that workforce shortage um, in communities who are starting to um, send out their servicing for policing in particular, but also EMS because they just cannot hire. It's incredible going across the state. It's absolutely incredible. The other point I just raised with respect to call volume, not only uh, it's probably intuitive the growth within our borders has an effect there, but also we're a pass through. Uh, with the turnpike going through us with Route 1, Route 22, there are tens of thousands of cars starting somewhere else and going somewhere else. And if they have an issue in our boundaries, we're responding to it. So there's the regional effect uh, that's not unique to us necessarily, but I'm sure that's a, a part of this. Narrative. It's a great point because it, it's amazing when I look at the, I have to dispense with the uh, EMS billings that don't get taken care of that goes through our process and the number of folks that we're dealing with with out of town addresses is amazing. So we, we service a lot of folks that are here working in, in different facilities or in motor vehicle accidents passing through town or and whatever. The seasonal it's, effect uh, has a factor too. So I, I have one, one last question. Oh, yeah, sure. okay. um, and thanks, thanks, Chief. You've been very helpful You're with your explanations um, and the great work that you and your team <coughs> does. Um, I, I, oh, under the impression that, at least on the, on the uh, police side of the house, that we've been uh, pretty diligent about uh, passing costs along to people that have, you know, that require services. Uh, do you feel that we have? Uh, um, the fire or the EMS side. I know on the I understand the EMS that uh, a lot of those costs are passed. If you call for an ambulance, uh, you you pay the, the bill for that. Are we taking the same approach with our other services um, on the fire side, particularly I'm thinking of the larger uh, organizations, the big big box stores, those folks that you know uh, today may be a big percentage of uh, your calls, and in the future will grow uh, if plans follow along according to what we're looking ahead for development. So we do bill for things like motor vehicle accidents and cleanup and hazardous material spills that we have a, a law that allows us to recoup our costs for those. We also, similar to the police department, actually the police department does it for us, is we bill for the false alarm. So if we go to the, the alarm soundings uh, more than three times, similar to, to a burglar alarm, uh, then yes, we are recouping our costs for those needless runs. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank you. It, it's kind of a follow-up too right now. But it was kind of, you know, 75% of your visits are ER. I know my 98-year-old mom um, is in a facility. But a lot of times the staff at the facility, if it's anything medical, are <laughs> very nervous. <coughs> there have been several calls where they've actually called in, you know, rescue, and they, they come. But the facility is saying they don't get charged for those calls. Is so, there, is there an ability to say if they do call? You want to take that one, Rich? <laughs> I'll put you right on the hot spot. This is a hot topic. Uh, and it's don't go to the fire. He's new. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> such a... <laughs> oh, <laughs> the bus. Welcome okay. aboard. <laughs> but it, it seemed like that may be an opportunity to generate revenue. Actually, storage down. I mean, because I think they think it's free. It's, it's, uh, they, it's absolutely a relevant uh, uh, conversation to be having. And uh, Deputy Lamori and I both have been meeting with some of the facilities that are considered high use uh, that we that I've recognized just in the short time that I've been here and um, coming up with some plans on how to try and alleviate some of that use that they've been calling us for calls that might not necessarily require an ambulance and an engine. I may have talked to you. I, you may, you may, you are, I can't, can't say yes or no. But, uh, we, um, so there is some room there. Unfortunately, there are some rules uh, that uh, that come with the, these facilities that uh, and some laws that we're trying to also yeah. Uh, circumvent um, but I think our goal is to try and provide some training and some outreach to them on how they can do their job a little bit better and not have to call us for everything and we've actually seen just in one facility alone uh, a significant de decrease in their use um, for for the non-emergent type stuff that they've been calling us for and there was just some misinformation out there I think uh, that some people thought that that we could just you know we were a non-emergency service we can come anytime and lift somebody up or, or you know whatever it was so it's it's current it's on the front burner for us for sure so i guess the question though would be not <clears throat> this budget cycle but whether there is some type of charge that could go in place legally that you could do yeah. 
and then two kind of put on, you know, maybe the top managers plays. I think at one point you did a distribution chart of where the calls are or where the volumes go. And we have a lot of medical facilities that are not for profit that don't pay any taxes, so they're really not paying for services that we render. And again, if that's a significant issue, is there some opportunity that we can get some quid pro, some in lieu of? because it's a very real for sure. cost. And, and it is at the, this, this is not just in Scarborough, the state level. I'm a member of the uh, regional council for the southern Maine region as well, and this is being talked about in every community because we're all being kind of stretched thin on some of these facilities that are moving in. Um, so this is something that's really taking some, getting some traction. So maybe next year we could have... We can, we can hope. Maybe a line item in the budget that helps us. <laughs> Yeah, the other tack would be negotiating a payment in lieu of taxes yeah. and using this sort of data and uh, as demonstration that we're providing valuable, expensive yeah. services and you ought to be paying at least something. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. If I can ask a question, Tom, actually this might involve you more, uh, but it relates to services because <coughs> of the expansion. So I know that Maine Medical Center mm -hmm. or Maine General or Maine Health I think is, is adding a, uh, a very large facility. 70 million, 59. So the question I have is that a facility like that, because um, they do typically pay some type of uh, uh, fee in lieu of a tax because they're generally a nonprofit. They don't um, typically. Don't they? Doesn't that company? <coughs> no. Oh, they don't. I thought that they were, they were one that did. Oh, okay. My, my comment is irrelevant then. Yeah, remember the, the premise of a payment in lieu of taxes is that they are exempt under the law, but they, right. by their own good graces choose to make a voluntary right. payment, and that's only as good as the tax year that it's offered in. So, um, but and I think we could- to cover services such as EMS, ambulatory care. Yeah, and I think we can make a very compelling or, case. Or others who go. We've got, you know, all we the do data. We those, absolutely. Okay. So, so I think there's an entry point with example. this new, uh, new expansion. I think we have an entry point for a conversation. Yes. yes. Yeah. That'd be great. I know Karen Martin has begun to at least approach that to see if we can start that conversation. <clears throat> Any other questions on the operating side before moving into the capital? So I think we're on page 54 in section 5 for capital. Is that right, Chief? And Tom? Go right ahead of it. In the budget book? It's tab 5, uh, page 62, actually. Oh, I'm just looking at the list. Tom, can you give, help me with the legend there on these? Uh, sure. A, B, R, B, A, B, 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 B. Yeah, we're all on page 54, which is just the spreadsheet. Oh, the, the front. Yeah, it's just, uh, I thought you were going to yeah, the no, narrative. Yeah, no, it's the nuts and bolts. And That's how uh, the, the numbers. The, those, uh, there's a legend at the very end of that spreadsheet on page 60. <clears throat> 60 uh, that gives you the key to that. And it's the method of finance. A is for appropriation, B is for bond. Uh, R's for reserve, <coughs> so on and so forth. What's T? Yeah, what's T? Is T. Trade in. For trade in. Oh, trade in. Okay. So, so a quick question. So, uh, on the fire engine, I'm assuming that would go to a prime? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I asked the question, but and so at this point, there is no, there's no, there's no debt service loaded into the budget because we don't know that it's going to be approved or not. So Correct. That one item alone will be referendum on the ballot in November. Correct. Yeah, and that's a good question. Because of that, should that be included in our capital budget? We, we think so, just to make sure that it's kind of relevant and people are seeing the need. But you're right, it does require a different, more rigorous process. Can, can you refresh my memory? What's a useful life? 20 years? So that is part of, <coughs> that is part of the discussion. And we have just, uh, within the last day, finished our apparatus replacement <coughs> plan up to date. Historically, all of our frontline apparatus, the, the engines, the ladders, the, the heavy rescue, all the Class A, if you will, uh, frontline pieces, have been traditionally a 25-year replacement program. That was established back in the 40s, and, and the fire department was the first department in town to, to have a replacement plan program. Uh, it served us well over the years. First in the state. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, for years, it, it, it did the job. Um, unfortunately, because of our volume and more importantly because of the environmental concerns with the, the calcium and, and magnesium products that we're using on the roads now for de-icing, 
the corrosion, uh, the miles, the hours that we're putting on these, 25 years is just not uh, possible anymore. And one of the things that Deputy Lamorier, who is in charge of our apparatus, worked with Jay Nason before he left, uh, retired from Public Works, and we started this process that we've uh, got a document that we're going to get to you uh, hopefully in the next day. Um, what we're trying to do is shorten that from a 25-year to a 20-year plan over time. And uh, the plan will, will highlight what those challenges are, why we need to move in that direction, and uh, also shows a comparison of um, how we've tried to help mitigate that. So one of the things that the plan talks about is <clears throat> we historically have um, purchased, bid, specified, and purchased our trucks really so they're a standard package and, and um, very consistent from truck to truck outside of the formal bid process. You can't always guarantee you're going to get the same bender, bidder, but they're all set up the same. They're all as similar as we can make them. And we did that for a couple of different reasons, primarily because we have such a diverse workforce of full-time per diem and, and call folks, and a lot of those folks work different stations and, and drive different trucks. So from a familiarity and a operational standpoint, we want them to be as similar. Also, for public works maintenance, we want to stock the fewest number of parts that we can, so we try to incorporate the same components to make it easier for parts and maintaining the, the, the fleet. During our deep analysis into this problem and how we were going to try to form our plan going forward, what we've decided is that we really should look at a, a two-tiered system for our, app, for our fire engines. Um, we've got a lot of small developments now down in, in Eastern Village, Dunstan Crossing, um, and so smaller trucks certainly are appealing. Uh, those neighborhoods are just extremely tight to get full-size apparatus in. Additionally, there's a huge difference in our town between the southern part of town south of the turnpike where we have pressurized fire hydrants and, and solid municipal water supplies and that area north of the turnpike where we have to depend on our cisterns, dry hydrants, and ponds. And that area requires special tactics for uh, bringing water to the scene and, and flowing water through you know, tanker shuttles and, and all kinds of different uh, operational opportunities. That being said, we feel that we could move to a two type of truck plan where we maintain our, our larger um, rural water supply setup that will serve us well in the two Route 1 stations and our North Scarborough stations, but for the Pine Point, Pleasant Hill, and Black Point, we can go to a smaller truck that will have uh, a smaller water tank because we have the hydrants every 500 feet have a smaller hose bed because we don't need to lay as much hose between uh, static water sources. And by doing that, we're able to save a significant amount of money uh, over the life of our plan, but also better uh, meet the needs of our department. So having two types of trucks instead of one uh, will end up saving some money. We also took a look at our ambulance replacement program, and, and uh, you'll see some data on how we've gone through a couple of different variations of replacing ambulances, and our third iteration of that uh, looks at uh, another option that will save up to $300,000 over the life of the plan. So we're, we're looking to try to do things more efficiently, more effectively, and less expensively. It seems to me, and this is uh, almost theoretical, <clears throat> more theoretical than it is applicable to the budget, to be able to achieve that kind of uh, dependence, it would require a lot more investment on the, even though it can save you money, it would require more investment on the infrastructure side, such as running water lines. So like on the south side, or what I call south side, you know, um, there's been talks about development and running water through South Portland into running Hill Road and kind of that area, and then maybe even through Westbrook, and, um, which is, it, it, to me, it seems it, at the very best neutral, if not still not cost prohibitive, because you still have to, you know, you're, you're going to have to invest in long term investments for the infrastructure part to save <coughs> operationally on your side. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, am I thinking in the right direction? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, those those developments right close to the line, there as they develop, I'm sure that there will be water, but I mean, mm -hmm. The water district itself doesn't extend mains anymore. No, unless you're right. Development, yeah, yeah, development yeah. should be paying for the, those <clears throat> capital costs for utilities. Oh, I understand that. I, I mean, I remember when Portland Water took down the tower, and in exchange, uh, we tried to get them to extend their water line to go down Sawyer Road, um, and that was very, very <laughs> difficult. And we had a friend on the Portland Water District. <laughs> you know, um, so, um, so this, um, any other questions on the operating side? 
It's worth noting, uh, engine two, the truck you're talking about, is uh, will be 31 years of service. By the time it's 31. Engine two is actually our spare. So we, we have six frontline engines, and then we have what we call engine two is our spare, and that sits in for one of the others when they're down for maintenance and, and work. And it's a, it's a frontline truck nearly 60% uh, of the year for yeah, one reason or another. Plug. In, our, in, in our internal public works department services those trucks, right? They absolutely they do, and they do a great job at it. <laughs> Mike, but that's just that. an example. Yeah, she missed the shower over your shoulder. It's like a mini me head on your shoulder. <laughs> we, should, we should mention that we work hand in hand with um, public works to develop yes. the plan, and it comes up with a recommendation of Jay, who gave us a lot of help just before he departed. Other questions on the capital improvements? Just, just a quick question. Yes. Um, are the replacement of staff vehicles? Mm -hmm. Is that something? Are there vehicles built into the negotiated contracts? I mean, is that part of the compensation package? And no, none of that is. Like none of that is for the collective body. Those staff vehicles are the the deputy, the two deputies yeah. and mine, and we have one for the uh, uh, the captain that uh, runs the whole duty crew. In response to that but that's it's not part of anything in the contract, no. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> and these vehicles are equipped such that these gentlemen can respond from their homes, um, and they often do. Um, so they're fully equipped to be able to respond to the scene, depending, you know, prepared to deal with whatever comes. Actually, we. it's not uncommon for us to take medical calls so that the apparatus can stay in quarters. During the day, the problem is they all park at the same time in front of the Oak Hill Station, so it looks <laughs> like we've got a lot of them. Yeah, so, um, um, before passing on, I, I got to uh, this one thing because you, um, so first of all, thank you for your service uh, for your entire thank you. I mean, it's incredible what you do for us. Um, but you've been around through a lot of this growth, and, um, it, and your team interacts particularly with the business side of the community that we don't. We here tend to hear more from the residential side. Can you share? Because one of the things that people often forget is that um, our businesses do have, um, they already are providing a contribution to the tax base in which they should have an expectation of some services. And so, you know, what is their response? Because I, you know, we talked a little bit about how can we. Uh, maybe uh, invoice them more for certain expenses, but they're already some of them are already paying taxes. So you know, I mean, what what is you know what are you guys hearing out there from our business community regarding the services that they're getting? Are we underserving them um, on your side? Are we um, overcompensating? <coughs> what what are you hearing from your professional? Affairs? No, I I mean personal. And professional. We have a very positive relationship with the business community. One of the things that, that we've done, and, and I can't take credit for this, my predecessor started it, was we had a very active fire prevention inspection program. So we are in every business in town, at least annually. Um, that is something that we're changing. We've gone to a risk-based um, scenario now just because there's so many of them that we're having a hard time getting to every single business every year. So we're going to a model now where if you you know have a, a modern building that's sprinkled and and you don't have a history of, of uh, violations and those types of things we're going to be seeing those folks maybe every other year or even every third year and we're going to concentrate on those that that have a lot of violations or that are unprotected and and create a hazard for the public their customers and, and, and everything else but all in all I, I think that the business community appreciates seeing us I mean you know, like any group, we have a, f a few that would rather not because we, you know, we bring up things that they, they may not have taken care of like they should. But, but in, in general, and, and you folks are closer to the street than I am, uh, I think the feedback that we get is, is generally quite positive. The feedback's positive. <clears throat> and, uh, the other thing to mention is that our, our, our service demand, uh, other than health care facilities, our, our next biggest driver is residential you know and that can be uh, um, multi-family or single family uh, as far as standalone business properties they don't see us on an emergency basis as much many of them are protected with sprinklers and um, automatic fire alarm systems uh, and we'll you know we'll occasionally see them with a fire alarm activation our, our service demand is more towards residential one, one last question 
about you know the, the the conversation about the staffing. You know, you guys have done an exceptional job as far as I know with the staffing that you had. Do you think, without the, the model you put forward, that there's a risk that what is the risk? What's sort of the risk if that's a little bit different? I don't want to be. Alarming. I, I can tell you that you, you look at what's happened historically. We just had a, a very challenging fire in Berwick where we lost a member. Yeah. The report isn't out yet. NIOSH is in there doing that investigation okay. now. Um, but I will guarantee you that part of that investigation is going to talk about staffing and the yeah. number of folks that were available. Short-staffed. Short-staffed. And the, and the number of folks that were available when they needed to make that initial attack. Uh, and I think you know, there's going to be some lessons learned out of that. We don't want to, we're trying to be proactive. We don't ever want to be in that position. Uh, that's why we've cited the national standards and, and where we feel we need to be, and that's why I advocate as hard as I do to, to be where we should be. It's interesting you use that as an example because I actually work in that community. Um, as a commercial officer, and I, I'm very familiar with the location of the fire department in conjunction with the bank branch that I work, uh, one of the bank branches that I work out of and the, and the location of where the fire was, and it's not that far. And it doesn't make any difference if you don't show up with anybody on the truck. And the reason is that if you have a, a call fire department, it's very difficult because of their responsibilities with their employer and um, everything else that they just, you know, so I completely empathize and I understand. Um, and I'm going to use the sounding board to say thank you, but also um, I think that your budget, along with what I'm sure we'll hear from the police department, emphasizes that while this community focuses a lot on educational services and the cost of those over the long term, um, is that while we can change the demographic of who lives in this town and we can focus on seniors, um, their impact and their demand for services is seen in your budget, as well as the police department, as well as in community services. So it's nice to have these three budgets presented together. So I appreciate your willingness to do that because they have an impact on this community just as much as children do. So thank, thank you, you for what you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. I had wanted to make a comment on kind of demand for service, and it might be the appropriate time because it's a theme that's going to run throughout. Um, you know, you heard at the school level, their issues are kind of frontline and more acute, maybe even crisis proportion. What we've been able to do on the town side is really absorb a lot of that. And so I don't think you've heard us really be alarmist about it and, and say that, you know, it's, it's killing us. Uh, you know, fire department, for instance, has been able to do a lot through the per diem program. These are professionally trained firefighters. Uh, we think there's a better way uh, through full-time staff to do it, but these these are folks that have provided very good service for us, and, and without that, I think we would be in a different situation. Public Works has tried to do more with less, and you know the plow run might be an extra 10 minutes next year, and no one really notices that. But at some point, that's going to you can you can bend only so far, and so the service demand is certainly a part that uh, runs throughout the budget, both uh, town and school alike. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Police. <coughs> Chief Moulton. Deputy Chief, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good. Usually you have a whole entourage, okay. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Chief, I want to say congratulations on your 40 years. I missed the celebration, but uh, you don't look a day over 50. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I started really, really young. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, I'd like to thank you for having the, uh, for allowing us the time to discuss our budget. Um, I would say that uh, our budget, for the most part, is a level services, what I would consider a level services budget. Um, with the exception of the requested positions, which I'll speak about later, we really aren't uh, looking at any program changes or increases. Um, that's not to say that we don't have some new programs. We've done some things like uh, Operation Kind, which is a, a collaborative with the schools and High Five Fridays and that kind of thing. And, um, we have some other initiatives that we're going to be rolling out, but they're no cost uh, initiatives. So we're not looking to really make any program changes. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't spots in our budget where you'll, where you'll see increases. Um, and, uh, but those are generally not new costs. They're simply reallocated costs from other areas. And I'll give you some examples. We, we uh, created a lieutenant's position 
here during this current uh, budget year. And the rationale for that was that uh, our <coughs> patrol sergeants have been uh, overloaded with administrative duties, and it really took them away from the street and their ability to, to work with their teams and be out there to supervise and back up their folks. And um, we recognize that as an issue. And so I talked with the manager, and he allowed me uh, to, if, as long as I could do it within my budget, to uh, to elevate uh, one of the sergeants to the rank of lieutenant, which we did. Um, so that's a that's a new money that shows, but it's uh, it's six thousand dollars. It's the difference between a sergeant and, and a lieutenant's position. We didn't backfill that. Um, so. As a result of that, you'll see like an increase in our administrative budget, but that's simply because that salary, the whole salary, not just the difference in the salary, but the whole salary um, for Lieutenant Barker has been moved into the administrative side of the budget instead of the um, police services side of the budget. So uh, it appears like a, a, an increase in the administrative budget, and that's the driver of that, and that's where that comes from. Um, we were not budgeted to backfill the position, and so uh, that that is the only change is that six thousand dollar difference. So um, some of the other differences with uh, changes here, we've we've listened to the discussions that have taken place in prior budget meetings and finance workshops, as well as the direction from the manager, and we really strived in this uh, in this budget to move as much from uh, capital to uh, to our operating budget, uh, which. Um, so you'll see some increases in operating budget, but uh, those are offset by things that we have taken out of the capital budget. So um, an example of that would be tasers. We uh, have 40 tasers, and those have a, have a, uh, a life span of about five years, and the warranty runs five years, and, and uh, the recommended change out of those is five years when they're necessary we don't want them failing so we have had it in our capital line for some time now to replace eight of those every uh, every year so that every one of them will replace when they're five years old so we've moved that to our uh, to our operating budget taken out of the CIP so you'll see an increase in that line um, we uh, You'll see a fairly significant increase in our new vehicle account. That's not because we're buying a lot more new vehicles. So I can explain what's happening there. Uh, that, in part, is due to the same exercise of moving things from CIP. And we had five uh, unmarked vehicles that we uh, have generally carried in the CIP budget, and we would uh, those are we buy those as used vehicles, and then every five years one of those or each vehicle goes out every five years. So we rolled that back into our operating budget, so you see that increase. We also have had a pretty substantial increase in the uh, marked police units. They've gone up uh, uh, significantly, about $3,500, 10% <coughs> uh, increase um, uh, this year. And we also uh, are looking at um, we, we added some additional money into that new vehicle account because we are trying out, in this current budget, we are trying out one of those vehicles being a hybrid. And um, that's an additional $3,000. Um, we want to compare that to the other models and see if the maintenance and repair cost and fuel mileage uh, makes it a cost-effective solution. Uh, so we do have the money in that budget in the event that that does work out and we order those new ones that we would be able to, to go with the hybrid version. Now having said that, um, if there are offsetting costs, fuel and, and uh, repairs and so forth, that will be money that won't be spent in this proposed budget and we would uh, offer reductions <coughs> in the following budget. But we don't know that that's going to be the case so we really can't do that at this point. Um, the only one that we did leave in our CIP program at this point, uh, the only the only CIP item that we do have, is for the replacement of, a, of the Tahoe that we have. Um, we use that for a variety of uh, different things, transporting the uh, SWAT team, transporting uh, the honor guard to places, uh, bringing people. 
uh, when we have training and there's a number of folks going, being able to, to pile people into a vehicle like that. So we have left that in the CIT program for this year and, and really only because I already had such a substantial increase with the other things that we were doing with adding the uh, unmarked vehicle and the, and the price of the new vehicles and the hybrid option and so forth. So uh, I did leave that one this time around, but again, that's the only thing that we have in CIT. Um, we also have some additional in, uh, expenses that uh, are a result of some things being changed around town-wide. We are taking over uh, some of the responsibilities that community services had at the co-op. So um, we will be dealing with boat launching and, and some of the parking lot enforcement, which has changed down there and so forth, and, uh, and some of the repairs and, and things will come under uh, our marine resource budget now instead of uh, community services, so you'll see some increase there. Um, we had to increase our utility lines for the new facility, and that's we're not sure exactly what that's going to look like. Um, we, we increased that, but now there's talk that uh, because of the winter conditions this year, that um, when the, in December, January, that time frame next year, the building should be closed up and they may be starting to use the, the actual heating system and so forth um, to heat the building during the building process. And so we're not sure exactly how that's going to work out, but that's an increase to that line. Um, and so with the exception of salary and benefits, which I consider fixed cost, um, and the new positions that I have requested that I'll talk about in a few minutes, those are really the, the major changes. And I, well, I say that, um, I say that, and I fully recognize that some folks will argue that salary and benefits really aren't fixed costs because they should be, those are dealt with at, uh, at negotiations and so forth. And I, and I understand that mindset, but I can assure you that those factors uh, I really looked at uh, with a discerning eye during negotiations before they're ever brought before the council for, for consideration on a contract package. And, um, at, at the same time, I think it's imperative that we offer a package that both attracts and retains good people. If anytime you pick up the paper lately, uh, you see that police departments are having a really, really difficult time hiring folks, and there are agencies right around here, right around us, that are 10, 12, 15 people uh, short, and um, and so it's a it's a tough process. And I think in order to get some good people and keep them, we have to we have to uh, have an attractive package. So. Um, those are built in. I, again, I consider them fixed cost once they're built in, and, and we don't really have any control over that in this budget. Um, and, I, and I'd say that, uh, you know, when we talk about attracting and retaining uh, folks, it, it's really not an easy task in today's world. And Mike talks some about it with the fire folks, and uh, it's, true of, it's true in our business, too. We just don't have people stepping up that want to be police officers or dispatchers. And, um, it's it's hard to it's hard to blame them really uh, with some of the things that are going on. Um, I saw within the last day or two, and I, I meant to save it, but I didn't. It was a chart that showed the decrease in applicants for a variety of different positions, and on the top um, was police officer, and I think it was a 63 percent decrease in applicants over the over the past five years, and I think that's probably true. We're we're doing we're running a process right now. We've got 14. Um, applications that'll, uh, that will close on May 5th. Um, there certainly are times when we would have 50 or 60 applicants when we, <coughs> when we would have an opening. So um, there's no question in my mind that, that all of that is true. Um, you know, they're, they're difficult uh, jobs to fill in today's world. I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, Common decency, respect for any type of authority is is not as common as it was at one time. We're we're dealing with a, and I'm not saying this is a scare tactic, but we're dealing with uh, more and more violence. We're dealing with things that are uh, going on that people wouldn't consider happening in a in a small community, but they do. Um, tomorrow there'll be a statewide radio silence uh, for a moment to remember. 
Corporal Cole, who was murdered in a small community where nobody ever would have suspected that would happen. Um, and we see it in the news every day that departments uh, just aren't able to fill, and those are some of the reasons why. Um, so balancing the, the need of the taxpayers to keep costs in check while still being able to attract, uh, attract and retain good people is just not as simple as some people might think it is. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about, if, if you're ready to talk about that, is uh, there's some new positions that I propose. I think one of them is uh, still, as far as I know, uh, still yes. in this uh, yeah. proposal. Uh, there are a couple that aren't. I wouldn't do that. I, I would take it out without telling you. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, one of the positions uh, that is still in is the uh, the navigator position. Uh, well, that's what I'm calling it, a social services navigator position. And you've seen the position paper on that, I think. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to bore you by going through all that again. But I, I think uh, you know it's just important to to realize the the things that our folks are dealing with today. There's so many mental health issues. There's so many. Um, Substance use disorder, domestic violence, sexual assault, homosexual, and we'd like we'd all like to believe that those things don't happen in our community, but I can assure you they do. And um, you know things like even things like human trafficking, which people would uh, probably raise their eyebrows to think that that happens, but it does. And uh, those are all things that we're dealing with all of the time: um, bullying. Uh, suicidal ideation, lots of social issues that we're dealing with more and more. And uh, so the idea, as you know from the, from the thing, is I, I think our, our folks, our officers do a, what I consider a great job of dealing with situations in the moment. Uh, you know, they go to, they, we respond, we resolve the immediate crisis and we move on. But we don't really have any, anybody in place um, to, to really pull these, connect the dots and realize that there's a significant issue going on for an individual. And one of the, one of the things that we've, uh, I think one of the lessons maybe that we've learned from Operation Hope is, um, is just our ability to be able to meet people where they are and to resolve the underlying issues that they're facing. Instead of just um, responding and dealing with these immediate crises, I think we owe it to our, to our citizens and to the officers, frankly, to uh, to try to deal with the underlying causes of these things and see if we can't resolve a situation instead of just continuing <coughs> to respond to them over and over and over again. So that's the that's the real um, gist of that position. Um, I, I see it as a I see it as a townwide position. I, and I know that there are other departments. Um, that deal with some of these issues. Uh, you know, Nancy at the library talks about you know, some of the homeless folks that show up and, and camp out in, the, in her place. And, uh, and I know some of our other departments deal with these. The rescue deals with these. So I, I see it as a, as a town-wide position, really. We take referrals from, from anybody, uh, any other departments. But it would be our way of being able to and I'm not looking for necessarily somebody who has uh, a high degree of, of uh, licensure or, or in, in counseling or any of that sort of thing. I'm really looking for somebody who's, who's familiar and understands uh, trauma and is familiar with what resources there are available for whatever problems um, somebody may be dealing with them so that we can and that's why I named it as a navigator because I think that really is what it is is navigating the social services systems trying to find help for folks and get them the uh, get them the resources that they need um, we also have just started a, a peer support team because we recognize how difficult it is for for our officers and dispatchers and, and such that deal with these uh, difficult calls and uh, <clears throat> and don't have a lot of I mean, we have an EAP program, certainly, and, and there are other uh, folks that they can turn to, but my feeling is is that having somebody who understands those issues in place uh, around the station would probably uh, um, generate uh, uh, some situations where people, officers, would take, the, take that time to talk with these folks. So... Um, and, and lastly, I think, uh, you know, with some of the new initiatives with the school and so forth, 
we also have looked at how that position could uh, could collaborate there and, and be a resource for the schools as well. So that's the gist of that position. I'll keep going, or I can stop for questions if you want. Yes. Want to ask questions now? Go ahead. Uh, I have two five. Uh, you know, one uh, on your initiative we're uh, focusing on this position of social services navigator, and uh, and I think as with uh, what we heard from uh, Chief Thurlow that uh, that you know, I think public safety in general, you're, you're dealing with a lot of things that in the past were maybe handled by families or other institutions. So you know, we know that's uh, that's demanding. Um, do you, can you think of any other communities that have a similar role like this? Uh, in the area or in the state and what kind of experience they've had with it? Yeah, actually, uh, we've, we've sat down with uh, South Portland uh, and talked with them. They have a, they have a similar uh, position, and um, it's, it's uh, gone quite well for them. We've sat down, we've talked to them about how it works, what they do. Um, it's, uh, you know, this is certainly not in place of an officer or anything like that, but they do respond with officers on certain kinds of calls if they're there. They do do follow-ups with officers on, on different types of situations. Uh, and they have had a, a really good experience. Now, I think part of it is in finding the right person. They happen to hit on, uh, hit, hit on a great situation with a person that had some really good uh, background. And... Um, and has fit in very well and is, is, is doing good things for him. And a related question, yeah. Chief, if I may, and, and that's, that was a good explanation. Thank you. Uh, I know there are, there are likely other services that are similar services that may be provided at a, uh, uh, at a county level or maybe in neighboring towns. I know there's Opportunity Alliance and other groups like that. So can you talk for a moment about uh, your expectations for the how this person would interface with other groups that may be doing that at a county or, you know, a neighboring city level? Sure. I mean, I think, uh, I think there are those groups that get together. Um, and if, if I could back up, uh, Councillor, for a minute and, and talk about just other agencies and so forth. There, the other thing that I would mention is that there are other agencies that have um, people that are specific to a certain... Uh, call type or situation or whatever. So uh, Portland, for instance, will have people that, experts really in their field that deal with uh, sexual assault victims and that type of thing. And there are folks that deal with domestic violence issues and, and substance use and that kind of thing. We don't have enough of any one particular thing that uh, we would be looking for somebody with that kind of expertise. We would be looking for more, uh, again, not necessarily to be the counseling piece, not really to fix their problem, but be a navigator to get uh, folks to it. In, in terms of collaboration with other uh, other uh, agencies and so forth, certainly we would uh, we would look to do that. I think uh, it would it would not make sense not to. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yep. Just a quick question as it kind of relates. So the, the social service services navigate, what what is that fully loaded as a as a cost? Seventy five thousand, six eleven. So reading the description of what you're talking about, I mean the, the way it's described, you're right up, this is new position of social service navigate, which you talked about. In absorption of community service built launch program, is it the same person that's gonna do both of those functions? No. Uh, okay, so you're saying that's somewhere else in your budget. And then, so my question is, I understand the social navigator. Mm -hmm. Yep. But if a lot of the revenues flow to community services, why is the administration of the parking come to the police department and not stay in the... What we're trying to do is keep the, the revenue centers and the cost of operations in the same place. So what's sort of the thought process that you would, you would take over that parking function from the... Service. Well, part of the issue has been that uh, Todd has had a very difficult time with um, some of the uh, younger folks that he's employing down there who aren't, because they don't have a uniform, because they have no authority or whatever, they're, they're not, uh, they can tell people the rules in the parking lot and so forth, but they're, they're not, uh, they tend not to listen to them. 
Let's put it that way. Is that, is that fair, Todd? <laughs> 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 that's the point. Yeah, there's no enforcement ability at all. But the revenue does go back to PDT. Both of those have switched. Oh, the revenue switched. Yeah, yeah they both, they both it's a, go. It's a swap. It's, it's so management you, and revenue, management and revenue. Uh, okay, so, so that, yes. that other part yes. of it, yes, sir. piece yep. was done. It's, yeah. it's really having a sworn officer and actually having the harbor master be on site, boots on the ground, really provide that uh, direct supervision uh, when we need it. I will also add that we're further complicating the enforcement responsibilities by, for the, and we should have done some time ago, but we're now assigning spaces specifically for commercial fishermen. And we can expect there'll be some challenges, and we need someone of some authority to uh, yeah. to make sure that everyone's playing by the rules. So, from a budget impact of view, if you've got revenue coming in and some caught, is it a wash? Pretty much, it's not really a budget impact. Um, I think percentage-wise, it's really not that much of an impact because uh, we also the they also brought the history with it, if you will. So. Um, these are not brand new costs that are showing up in my budget. They don't have a history to go with it. So percentage-wise, it's not a big, it's not a, uh, right. <coughs> I was, I was about 14.8 last year, made about 15.2. Both those costs came, came over. Okay. Well, but again, the 15.2 is revenue and lease fees, all that piece of Thank you. Thank you. Robbie's costs are slightly more. He's paying his staff more per hour because of a higher skill set. Um, so there's a slightly higher cost, but we think a much better product. My last question is I was sort of following your conversation on hybrid, but sort of not. So <laughs> in the budget, yes. we have one hybrid and regular cruisers, or are they all budgeted hybrid? In this current budget, which, which, the, one the one that, that we're in right now. The one we're in right now. The one, yeah. Not the proposed, but the one that's, okay, that's active, right. active right now. Yeah. Um, I get talked into... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Looking at a high, we order, we order four marked cruises a year. In this particular year, um, we had a situation where we had a dealership that had one leftover vehicle that was, um, that was pretty much met our specs. And then um, we had this hybrid option. And so uh, for- You're right twisted. <laughs> My arm got twisted, and for a little bit of extra money, we were able to do that, and I'm told that the offsetting um, fuel costs and so forth will, will make that work. So having said that, what our, our intent is, much like uh, before we went to the, the SUVs that we have now, the Chevrolet had gone out of business, and, and people were doing all kinds of different things, and we bought one of each model and compared them. And, and, Public Works keeps great records, and we know exactly what repair and maintenance uh, looks like and what fuel costs look like. So that's our intent to do with this, is to, is to compare that side by side uh, with the regular gasoline uh, vehicles that are the same thing. So, so in this budget, yeah. I, I put additional monies in the event that that worked out and we ended up buying the hybrid models for next year. But it's not an additional vehicle to our normal <coughs> yeah. fleet cycle. It's yeah. So uh, it's a it, premium. Yeah, what's the premium that's in the Three grand. Three thousand. Per Three. vehicle, but how many vehicles? Just one vehicle. Oh, just one vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I have one small question. Sure. So I think it was about three years ago, maybe four years ago, we started a very different policy and procedure relating to beach management, particularly Higgins Beach, and mm -hmm. how we dealt with the community and some things. Sure. How is that going? I mean, three years later, is this, have we been successful? Are there still challenges? Because, you know, of course, counselors still Just receive yes. some distress from, you know, that don't want it still. And, I mean, where are we? Um, I think there's always challenges at beaches. And, and, you know, so that's, that's, all, that's a given. But I think if you, uh, if you talk to the people at Higgins Beach uh, and the people that have communicated to me uh, have communicated that it has been very successful. And they, they're relatively satisfied. Aside from some mechanical challenges with our meter system, which yeah, we, we have hope we've ironed out, but the real key to success is his staff on the ground. Uh, those reserve officers are really true ambassadors. They're um, very personable and are able to really work through those situations. The only struggles that we really have is, is that it's really, as it's difficult to hire full-time police officers, it's difficult to hire reserve officers, and oftentimes 
Uh, we're going through a process right now to try to get people lined up for this year, and we've been in this process since about January. Um, but we, you start out with a group, and as things move yeah. along, you end up losing them uh, for a variety of different reasons. They, they can't pass the, the physical tests that are required by the academy. They don't pass written tests that are required by the academy, or they get a job someplace else. Uh, and so that's the only thing I would say about the beaches. The, the only difficulty that we have, really have is making sure that they're staffed as much as, uh, as, much as we're trying to because it's just difficult to get people. But we do have the advantage that we have VIPs and we have um, uh, our explorers, and they've been very helpful. Some things they can do, some things they can't, but they've been very helpful in supplementing uh, where they can, and that's, that's been a help to us as well. Thank you very much. Last quick question on the, on the social services navigator. You've done a great job, I mean, you've got a great reputation. And congratulations on national coverage and other things. Of, Thank you. But is there any grant opportunities to have? I'm sure you've pursued all those things, but going forward, will you be looking at whether there's any opportunities to kind of offset some of that cost by? Sure. I haven't. I haven't subject. seen any. I haven't yeah. seen any yet. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm not still looking. I, I serve on the Justice Assistance Council, and I've talked with. Um, some of the folks there to get some ideas about where um, where some federal funding might be available and so forth. I, I haven't come across any. We did, uh, I think you're aware that we did just uh, uh, get an AmeriCorps VISTA member volunteer. Oh. Uh, we do have that position that's that's coming. That, that won't have anything to do with this. It's going to be helping us with Operation Hope, and it's a one-year grant, but uh, we're going to take advantage of that. One last question. Uh, uh, you know, Chief uh, Thurlow did a, a really good job of pointing out how uh, call demands and uh, staffing challenges have you know, driven the need for staffing requests. And, and I want to thank you for uh, being modest in the ones that you're putting forward. Can you speak to the to the patrol officer position and the dispatch coordinator and how you know, the rationale for this? I can, and, and thank you for asking. I, I, the, that was my next uh, next place to go. Um, we did put in for two police officers this year, and um, and uh, you know they haven't made it to this point. But I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Here's where I'm at. Um, our our call volume's gone up uh, about just under 10 percent this past year. Um, but my real uh, struggle is with the number of people that we can put on the street at any given time. Um, you know, we when, when we look at the neighborhood fire stations, and our forefathers in this community felt that it was uh, necessary to have six different fire stations because of the response time and, and the ability to, to bring people out and so forth. And, and I'm not advocating that we have six police officers out there at this point, but um, Right now, we've, we've looked at, uh, at what we can do, and um, we have found that, uh, that about 63% of the time, when we look at the shifts uh, over the past uh, 2018, we had 63% uh, we had of our shifts, 695 shifts, were limited to three people. And... Um, we're just at a point where I'm not comfortable with that. And we're too big a community. We're 54 square miles. We have too many calls that require two officers. And it, it, it's, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be an alarmist either, but, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a good situation, you know. And it's, uh, if you think about, if you were out driving around and you were in Pleasant Hill and you think about, a family member or a loved one being at, let's say, at Broad Turn and Holmes, and how long that would take you to get from Pleasant Hill Road to Broad Turn and Holmes to help them. That's a, that's a long, <coughs> a long stretch. And that's not even being extreme. I mean, we could be down at the Cape Line on 77 and have to go to Buxton Corner or something. It's, um, I, I think the time has passed when we can really uh, feel like we can manage with three people on the road. And 
like I say, we're more and more of our calls now are two-person calls, domestics, mental health issues, all kinds of different things. And so when those two people are tied up on a call, we've got a person there that's by themselves. And, you know, 40 years ago, I worked by myself at night, and we got through it. But I don't recommend that today, not with the, not with the things that we see happening every day. And so... I asked for the two officers, and the, and the rationale was when I looked at uh, the number of shifts that, that had that minimum staffing of three people, um, like I said, it was 695 shifts, or 63% of the time, and in order to, to do that, if we were to fill those shifts so that we didn't have any shifts that had, uh, had only three people, there's 5,560 hours of time that would need to be filled. And when you look at availability of a, even a brand new officer, it's about 1,888 hours or something when you factor in an average amount of vacation time used, a couple of sick days and so forth. And uh, so we're, we're really dealing with almost three officers, 2.94 officers to, to make that happen. So I would love to be in a position to say, that our minimum staffing is now going to be four people or three officers and a supervisor. I think that's where we need to be. But I can't do that. I don't have the bodies to do it, and I don't have, even if we would pay overtime to try to do that, I don't have the overtime budget that would support that. And even if we did, I would wear people right into the ground. Um, so that's my rationale. Um, and can you just give us the figures for those for the patrol officers and the dispatcher and some of what we did for Sure. The, the, um, I'm sure it's in your someplace, but I can't recall. All in for two officers, $157,032. That can be found on exhibit uh, 1D in tab 7. Okay, thanks. I just, uh, if I remember correctly, at least years ago, the benefits, because you have to budget for the maximum, was about 22000 Twenty-one, twenty-two. It's in that order. Because you have to, in. you have to budget it, assuming that. Correct. People don't. People think sometimes when people hear these numbers, they think that's what they're getting for a salary. But yeah, it's, yeah. It's all inclusive of the benefits. Right. Absolutely. <coughs> it's it crazy. Like pension. It includes Absolutely. a retirement. Yeah. Right. Like a Medicare. Yep. Yeah. Thirty percent of pay. The healthcare expert. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The other, th the other thing that I would note is, um, you know, the call volume, and it's, and you can look at numbers and so forth. And like I said, we've had a 10% increase in, in police calls this year. Um, but more importantly, I think if if you look at the hours in a year, 365 days times 24 hours, you end up with 8,760 hours. There are 7,007 hours that, or 80% of the time, that we've got somebody tied up at least one person tied up with a call for service. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a lot of time that we've got people tied up. And when we're at that minimum staffing, like I said, where <coughs> some of these are two-person calls, <coughs> that's a lot of time. I understand also yeah, there's uh, time, uh, court time, that sort of thing. Do, do you have a factor for that? What percentage of your time is required for your officers to appear? Well, a lot, of time, a lot of times our officers that are in court, are going to court, um, it, it's generally overtime because, except for the day shift team, the evening folks and the midnight folks would be, you know, going to court on. But there, there certainly are day shift uh, folks that have to go to court. We, we try to minimize that um, by having a court officer uh, go in, our detective sergeant goes in, and unless somebody is truly ready for trial and so forth, they try not to drag that person in until that's really about to happen. And that took some um, negotiating with the judges because there was a time when they required every officer that was on the list to be there regardless uh, because if, they decide, if the judge decided that he wanted to hear that case this moment, he wanted people sitting right there. We've been able to convince them that that's a very expensive uh, position to put us in. And they have allowed us to do it the way we do, and we have a, we have the ability to call the officer in and get, and I think it's a half an hour that they've got to get them there. So that's how we've managed that. In, the, in that conversation you just had, though, Clint, it still sounds like you put a higher weight on the social service navigator than you do the additional police officer or officers. Um, 
I think both are, I think uh, both I, are I, important. I, know, I, know, <laughs> I think, I just, I think both are very important. Um, I, I would say that the, uh, I, I would like to hope that this number, this percentage of shifts that are, are at minimum staffing may close up a little bit because we're dealing, we've been dealing with a couple of uh, situations where we've had people um, out on injury. And, uh, but I say that thinking that if we weren't in that situation that we might have a better chance of filling that out. But we just lost another officer um, to a, a shoulder situation that'll be out for a number of weeks. And it seems like over the course of time, that's just, it just happens. There's almost and never a time. It's almost never a time when, for one reason or when you've got everybody available to you. It's all injuries on the job. Necessarily. Yes. Yes. Not necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it can be anything from, Injuries on duty to something that's happened off duty, a sickness, uh, any number of things. It just always seems like it, you know. And if somebody if somebody decides to uh, to resign or retire or something like that, there's a period of time there that you don't have somebody while you're trying to fill that position and so forth. So, um, I, I look at I look at these positions as a pool of people. Couple is not a big pool, but a pool of people that we could have to offset those things. If we, with our current staffing, if nothing was out of place, we could make it happen. But it's just not, not the reality. Any other questions before going into capital projects? Um, well, I, I did want to mention the uh, the dispatch coordinator oh, position. Sorry, I'm sorry. If I could, no, that's fine. <laughs> Um, I, I just think we're at a time where we uh, we have 14 dispatchers in there, and we have uh, we have for the past few years um, had uh, a sergeant overseeing that. But it's a collateral duty of that sergeant. They've got other responsibilities and and so forth. And we're also at a situation, um, and without. Uh, naming anybody specific, but we we have had communities reaching out to us of late to ask about the possibility of, uh, of doing their dispatching and so forth. And I think it comes at a time when we're going to be moving into a new building. It's built uh, in in such a uh, a way that we could accommodate that kind of thing. And one of the explorations that we need to do is whether we could do that and do a good job of it. I've always said we don't want to be the Walmart of dispatching, but if opportunities present itself that will help with revenue um, and would also allow us uh, with additional people, you can absorb some of those things that happen when people are out. So um, I, I think it makes sense to, to really look at that hard, but I also think even considering that, that it's time that we have somebody who's truly dedicated to that room and to, uh, to everything that goes on with it. And we're getting more and more situations, as, as you're aware, with legislation and so forth, where we need to have somebody who, uh, who can go and testify and, and understand what's happening in that world. And Steve's done a great job with it, but it's not his, uh, you know, it's not his main focus either. So, um, I just think it's a time that we need to at least look at that. And again, I recognize the situation that we're in, and I recognize uh, you know, that all these things aren't feasible, but I think I, I owe it to you to, to put it in your mind. And the figure for that one? Uh, yep. uh, 93,912. Again, includes benefits. It's not total yeah, that's, salary. that's an so all. So obviously a sergeant level. Uh, yeah, it's very similar. So I very, very much appreciate your willingness to hear these out. Uh, okay. We have these tough conversations. They don't make the grade. It's not because there's not need, and I'm very pleased they have the chance to make you aware of the, the, the issues as well. So. <coughs> Just from a, having a little bit of an HR background, so you have one sergeant that takes care of 14 employees in the dispatch? We have, we have four um, 
team leaders. We have four lead oh, dispatchers. So one supervisor, four team leaders with yeah. ten in, then ten underneath that. Yep. The lead dispatchers are on the phone too, right? Yeah, the lead dispatchers are actually dispatching and they right. yeah, do, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yep. I was going to say, one person taking care of 14 people is not a very good HR model. Liam's shaking his head. So personally, Chief, I want to say thank you. Um, I have been saying this for years, and I still hold this true. If you ever came forward and asked for an, a line item um, allocation for Operation Hope, I hope this community says absolutely yes. What you are doing with that group is, is just wonderful, and I think the town should support that because we need to do more um, and, and show that we're doing it. It shouldn't just be hidden behind all the other line items. So, Kudos to your staff and management for being able to do what you do because it's pretty incredible. And we see that up in Augusta. Well, thank you. We see I, that a lot. I appreciate that. So, thank you. Thanks, Here comes the grilling. What's that? Community services. At some point, I, I need to know. What you have against community services, you've been oh, consistently. He just threw a, he just threw a paper clip at me. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I still got PD in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Second, today's my two anniversary, so yeah, yeah, thanks. Somebody wished me well earlier, like it was a torture. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it was. You made it that two minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. So I remember when you actually on your very first day. I remember yeah. that actually. So, yeah. Uh, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple things off, not off topic, but on topic. Uh, I just want to put a support out there for that public navigator. Some of the themes that are happening in town and some guy sometimes gets missed is that when we're talking about school challenges, we're talking about municipal challenges and, and police and fire, for instance, we don't consider the impact <clears throat> of the kids. And when school's talking about number influxes but also challenges, they're coming with certified, qualified, mandated staff. I've got staff after school, before school, that are seeing those kids. And one of the conversations we had in the navigator's position is just being able to close that loop where when you talk about, you know, a kid, you know, student A comes off the bus and he's, you know, you know when he's at level four, five, and six, you can see him growing into that piece. If we don't know that or can't follow up, we lose that piece, and sometimes we don't see them until they explode. And so we're dealing with that with a day-to-day -day community service base. So I, I do support the uh, community navigator position social services to be able to close that loop so I just wanted to say that um, and also um, I mentioned the uh, the beach as far as your question I had as a note just to make note on the uh, revenue for the mm -hmm. co-op so the sheet that I gave you is just kind of for me to work off of um, within this budget um, one of the things that I've worked really hard with 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 Tom and Ruth over the last two years to get to this point is reorganizing our divisions and so those five divisions at the top of the page administration rec intergenerational grounds and facilities of beach management um, this year we were able to finish that with kind of reorganizing where stuff is recoding it uh, which allows my managers in each area to have their own section to follow where revenue now matches expenses before it was rec had half of this line and child services had half of this line and they were always tracking so i just want to thank everybody for help getting to that point of where we are with that um, as you can see where our expense levels are and, and I've got you know greater detail on those versus our revenue um, you know to, to jump down a little bit because uh, Robbie had mentioned it as part of it you know two things we into this budget is reallocation of that co-op under his supervision in the marine resource officer um, since um, the new marine resource officer has been there it's been a breath of fresh air so I think that's a positive management structure for us to work in we will continue to be doing trash and bathroom cleanings at that location, so there's still some of that under the beach revenue piece. Um, also, one thing in this division piece under that third part note, um, 
Tom and I have agreed to relocate the municipal facilities, which is Garland and this facility, under the executive budget as it hosts nine departments. And so that was one of the challenges that we were working through through this budget is this facility has increased current demands and under the, the past years of trying to get closer to self-sufficiency, you know, when we're working under electricity, setting up meetings, the amount of use, um, this building, you know, because my, my thought was that, okay, if we take that and divide that by nine, it's still a common good cost that the town has to fund on its own because we're not closing that gap with revenue. We, there's no revenue source coming out of this building. It's just use. When you assign a building, it's staff, it's cleaning, it's set up, it's breakdown, it's the video crew. All those things are functioning, and so that is just a public good. So we decided to move it into the executive budget, still managing it, still, still doing the staff, but just as a functional piece to be able to start right-sizing what community service is because there's no other um, Parks and Rec Department that I know about anywhere that subsidizes the town office through recreational fees and use. So when you talk about trying to get closer to, um, because this brings us into the 90% self-funding portion, and the national average uh, that just came out in the last report is 27%. Most parks and recreation departments are 27% self-funding. Scarborough has op been operating in that 75, and now we're at that with that removal, that 90% range. And so what the community gets for the value and the services, I think our model is good, the shared resources we do with the school as far as our office doing the scheduling, our, our parks and grounds doing all the mowing, field prep, athletics, all that stuff is incorporated in that grounds, and I think that's a great model. It's just a community understanding that it's being supported in portion through user fees, which, which is fine. Is this when you talk about, excuse me, closing that gap, those are unrecoverable fees uh, for a lot of those resources unless we were to charge it off to another municipal department or the school. So that's a whole fundamental you know, when you talk about trying to get 100% self-funded, you know, when you have a, a parks and facilities budget that comes in at $634,000, all we've done in, for three weeks is prepare high school athletic fields to get ready for athletics. And so those are costs that we're not passing along to the school because that's been the process that we've used. But those aren't costs we're going to recover. And so I think that's, a, that's one of the, the, the goals of trying to break these up into divisions to be able to understand what services we're providing that have been a choice to process, um, but also what we can recover our fees at and then what thresholds they're at. Um, if you look at these divisions this year, um, our budget is a $145,000 increase, um, which, which in, on, on the revenue side, um, it's $155,000 in new revenues to offset. And so a couple of those things are, are big items that are based on programming. For example, in our in-generational side, in that division alone, there's an $87,000 increase to that budget. $19,000 of, of that is related to child care wages. $45,000 of that is related to summer camp wages. And there's two factors that deal with the wages. One, the number of staff we've been needing to hire. And two, the minimum wage increase when you go from 10 to 11 and then next year 12. Um, those are compounded when you're talking about 25 employees or 50 part-time employees at a, at a 10 week schedule. Um, so th uh, that's where uh, three of the factors as far as the budget increase, our vehicle maintenance line, and that's a, that's a decision we'll make through capital improvement, but um, steadily having higher replacement and repair costs for vehicles. Um, last year we were at $11,000 over the year before on uh, vehicle maintenance, and that's just the age and use of the fleet. Um, this year we budgeted for a $3,500 increase in beach cleanings just for the amount of frequency we had in dealing with the, um, uh, the algae uh, on the beach. So out of that 155, excuse me, um, $145,000 increase, those six th things make up $87,000 of that increase. Uh, and, and four of them are program based. So they're direct revenue where child care wages and summer camp wages are making themselves back you know, more kids, more staff. Um, our senior bus transportation is a $4,000 increase there. Uh, even in our food lines for meals that we're putting out, it's a $5,000 increase, but we've made six to date to offset it. So those are all program, revenue-based programs. And so that's kind of how we work through realigning this budget to be able to try to make changes that made sense, ones that we could choose whether they were service levels or ones that were programs uh, based on fees. 
We really believe this representation is a, a clear, more accurate representation of what community services does. One of the things that I think is endearing about community services through the years, when it didn't fit anywhere else, it went under community services. And, it, and you know, municipal facilities is a great example there. It really has no necessary need to be there. And so we, we've chosen to realign that under executive. That's a cost that we need to recognize and it needs to be reflected. I see Councillor Baybine smiling. I, I'm sorry, it's just uh, being the comic that I am, it's actually, I would actually look at it as uh, when somebody else didn't really want to do it, it always fell under community services. Fair <laughs> sure, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the revenue, so again, to your question before, those revenues or anything associated with rentals and fees have gone back over the executive side as well, so we're not passing the budget along with also revenues that accompany that, whether it's the, like the Garland yeah. building is in that, so any rentals, fees, Recoup of costs, whether electricity, custodial services, trash, all that stuff is getting passed back on the. the uh, There's still a lot more expense than there is revenue. But, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I totally I, agree with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If we, if, yes, we would have to start charging off this facility in a whole different fashion. And that would be a discussion that would be interesting. Uh, would you, because I, I get a lot of questions. Yeah. Only because I keep, I've been focusing on community services for 20 years. And absolutely. Some things I have forgotten, even though I, I know I know. So on the grounds of facilities, it's yep. $634,000. Uh, yep. Um, how much of that is all town hall related? Uh, town hall related? Roughly, roughly. It doesn't oh, matter. as far as town hall? Yeah, just town hall. No, grounds and facilities, it's just, there's, there's a tiny, tiny portion. We'll come in and street sweep the parking lot after, you know, get it ready for Mike's guys come through, but that's... Um, in the budget for the executive is contracted services for doing beds, weeding, mulching, pruning back trees. That's a that's a contracted service line under so, several thousand. It's okay. not much. I thought for some reason I was thinking that there was way more than that within that for the town hall. Not for town hall, no. No, no they have a separate grounds line for it, and that's pretty much goes all to the contracted services. <coughs> So the, so the other question I had um, is around um, child care revenue. Yes. So, because um, it's always a focus, there's a lot yep. of people in this town are like, why do we need to be providing child care services through town government? Yep. Um, can you kind of explain what evaluation you've done to be able to Absolutely. determine the market, uh, the market pricing yep. and how we price for those services and the cost? Absolutely. Um, so since I've gotten here, this has been kind of the... the, the, the conversation but also seeing what the school has done with the polls as far as seeing the impact of coming through um, we we've studied what other places are charging um, and we are a, as you can see we're a full freight pro, for you know for profit that's what and as far as as that our fees are um, kind of in the middle of what privates are um, things that we do for other folks is is convenience they're at the school they're at they get dropped off the vacation that sort of stuff um, we are presently looking at the demand. You can see at the bottom that program challenges. Those are the situations that we're looking at right now, how to meet the growing need of, of this. Mm -hmm. This is the first year for summer camp. We have 252 kids rolled in our summer camp program. We were full in six days. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got 70 kids on the wait list for that program. Um, our child care, um, you see the number of rolled. That's the max at each site based on the space that we have. Whether that's some, most of those facilities are just gymnasiums. Wentworth, we're allowed the cafeteria, the gymnasium, and a classroom, but those are in portion and percentage based on the day and time of the year. We get the gym for about a half an hour. We get moved out of the cafeteria, um, so sometimes those kids end up in the hallway. So there's a threshold. We are not state certified, but we function on the governing child space per square foot the amount of counselors, that sort of stuff. We just don't do the certification because of the building and the requirements um, of so you, that. So you just can't expand? Uh, we, the challenge for expanding is we need to continue to work with and evaluate what, if any, facility space is available within the school. We have been reaching out to private organizations. I've talked with local churches. I'm looking at town, town, uh, town property that we own, whether it's, you know, we've got different lots that are around, like, what would it cost to be able to build something? Could we offset it with the, with, the, with the new revenues? So we're going through that process right now. The challenge for us is, you know, finding space, then find quality staff to keep the program, because ultimately we want to keep a high-level product. Yeah. That's a different cause if we don't. Um, and then um, to be able to continue to, to train the staff. I think a greatest challenge, and I kind of touched on at the beginning, is, is our staff... Um, keeping staff and you have them coming in the morning for an hour and a half shift and then coming back in the afternoon for a three-hour shift 
So there's a certain person, whether they're young in their employment or they're a student, um, and so those those folks aren't coming with certifications and behavior right. management skills and depression, you know, signs and symptoms. So we're having to spend a lot more time on training, developing that training plan. Uh, we're presently in, in conversations with the school, police, and fire, like reviewing our emergency action plans and lockdowns, things we've never had to do in the past to mirror what the school does. So we're working through. Those are all challenges. And so when you look at off-site facilities, it just, you know, you, it might make sense financially, but can you meet all those things? Can you have a safe? Is it appropriate? Uh, can, it, can, we, can we fund it? And so um, to, your, to your question is, can we expand within the facilities? Yes, but it would take some restructuring. We're using essentially the common space, although much of that is already committed, Jim Dandy's and, and other priorities that the school's made. Right. Uh, the next step is to get into individual classrooms, and that's a, a challenging conversation, folks. Correct. That's a private space in some respects, and so um, that's a limitation. Um, so 70, 70 uh, folks that were turning away are on the wait list at summer camp, but also 45 families that don't have, that would love to have before or after care. And frankly, there's no private alternative. Uh, we've heard some real emotional uh, yeah, it's stories. It's been a rough three folks. weeks for the staff dealing with, you know, please, what are we doing? And and and, and so, because I know it's a videotape, some of these families will get in, because what happens is when you when you sign up for childcare, you have a two, three, four, five day issue. So what happens? Everybody buys five days, and then they come back. We give them till the middle of May to be able to come back and say, I really only need three days. And so then. My son needs three days, Tom's son needs two, we pair them up and that equals one. So that is an attrition of filling spots along the way to a certain level. Um, and so that's kind of the process we'll go through next to get some of these families in. But this is our greatest, and this, this is just the wait list. People stop putting the name on the wait list when they say, oh, there's 20 in front of you. They just, why am I putting my name down? So, um, so if you guys don't mind, if I can just expand, yeah. if you don't mind if I indulge. So I, it was kind of funny because uh, the manager actually started off saying, I want to know, and he was talking about, yeah. the, you know, what's my thing um, about community services. So I've always viewed community services, particularly in the past, um, as really what I, what I would consider what they call an enterprise account. Correct. And it's because it's, it's the only one that uh, really is revenue driven. Yep. It has the opportunity to make even more money if it so chooses, depending on philosophy and practice and so yep. forth. So that's kind of why I've always looked at it. And in the past, if you look at our audited statements, at least, because it's the only way to look at it, um, there have been years in past that we've had huge um, over budgets on revenues, meaning that they're much higher than they were projected with some additional increases, but not significant. And that's funded um, a lot of our general re um, general reserves. Yeah. So the, the, so what I was asking, and I mentioned this a couple of years ago when you started, but it was kind of easy when you started because yeah, you started. Sure. Um, is it easy last year? I, I thought so. <laughs> it definitely wasn't perfect. <laughs> Have we ever looked at what, what is the price break point where people will stop, where, where um, either enrollment starts to decline? Yep. Um, because I think that there might be an opportunity to go from where we're currently at to increasing it. Um, especially when you have, um, 20, uh, you have a 20% wait list. So, I mean, is there a price break that can get you higher on the revenue side? Um, you could always raise the fee. I think, I think functionally right now, until we understand some of the other factors of what other space is going to be coming, looking at what the school is, um, people, I've heard comments of, this is Black Friday, you have us over a barrel, you could charge whatever you want, all those type of things. And I'm like, this has been the fundamental question of kind of staying in that, that threshold that we don't feel like we're overcharging for the service. As you can see, based on our service level, we've got, to me, I look at this as a caveat to how good our staff is and what they provide for the level of service for their camp and for that. So when you start looking elsewhere, as far as raising that fee outside that bar, our child care director, Audra, and I are talking about, okay, if we brought in 10 kids, what's the next net level and what will we need for space and um, what is the impact? Because um, we were busing. We had planned last year to get all those kids in the wait list to bus kids from Blue Point School to Pleasant Hill, and because they didn't have a wait list last year, but with the incoming class, Pleasant Hill is at um, has five on the wait list right now, right now, and so those things are changing. So I don't have a number because I think there's a lot of variables to your question as far as just staff levels and supplies, and just I'd have to come up with a very broad matrix, and I think we it would take a while to agree on what those factors are to decide where is that threshold of 
we can charge another fifty dollars a week if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. This is a subset of it, though. Just I couldn't follow. If for child care, the base wages are going up nineteen. Yep. Summer camp wages are going up forty-five. Those yep. are a real cost. Yep. Did we adjust the fee schedules to those programs to reflect that known, or are we going to adjust? Right. This year we raised the we raised the initiation fee. Um, up to, to offset some of those costs. And so you can see that our revenue projections have gone up from the year before. Um, so look at the intergenerational line is where you'll... Right, in the intergenerational line. So we're bringing in significantly here. Right, we did that last year and this year we have the fee in where when you talk about child care last year for revenue, uh, we brought in... Um, you know, we had projected 775, and we had more kids sign up. We did that early in the year. Last year, we brought in $901,000, and this year, we're projecting $925,000 in revenue. But that's, that's pretty, last year is predicated on, let's just use a number, 100 bucks a week or something. Right, so, so the What I'm asking directly no. is that we know fixed cost, we right. So to answer, we only raised the, um, the fee $25. We didn't raise it per week. Um, we didn't raise, no, and not in this budget. So, so I, I think what Sean, just building what Sean was asking, so, yeah, yes. we have an opportunity, I think would be justified to say these are real costs because yep. of minimum wage changes that we didn't initiate. Is there an opportunity to put some more money into this budget to reflect, or is it too late of a process at this point because you've already got Yeah, this, this is <clears throat> done. When we do child care, that, those numbers come out in like December and people know they're going to start registering in March so it's like we would have to make that decision if that's what we're going to do in like September or October and work through that process and we put our, our next we do three brochures when that comes out to family so we could do that in a season you know but it have to be off cycle for this can you just think about that then that oh absolutely these are costs that we should legitimately be able to but, but the, my question back to is trying to figure out what that threshold because right now if you look at in a generational just on the child care line last year um, where's my revenue sheet it's going here um, just, just just use the intergenerational line I think it'll make your point for you yeah on the intergenerational line we brought in um, child care nine hundred one thousand uh, dollars in revenue and then this year's projected budget for child care alone that's not summer camp that's not seniors um, child care budget that we're asking for this year is five hundred forty-four thousand dollars. So it's a four, it's a four hundred thousand dollar net gain. <coughs> so that's what the decision yeah. needs to happen: is are we going to continue to to net gain to offset other stuff philosophically, you know? And so yes, we can look into what that is. I think I think for us, it's how do we expand that service and flow both of them. Yeah, and I, I, I want, you know, the people will listen. It, 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 I'm not looking to gouge uh, because this is the enterprise account. Yeah. Because there are families that are um, in a lower income yep. um, category that really depend on the fact that it's flexible and it is a lower price. Right. Um, I just think that there is a certain balance when it comes from town government services when you could be on the market. I've got a nephew with five kids. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it's darn expensive to go into the open market. I, th I want to say he's spending something like like 700 bucks a month. Oh, but, yeah. The, but, but do we're more than that. I mean, uh, <laughs> 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 just, just so you know. He was a, just, you know, he was a pit <laughs> in the uh, right. But I'm just saying for, we're, we're more than that. But our fee structure is somewhere in the mid midpoint. Uh, right. There's a similar issue that we need to be sensitive to that we're not underpricing the market. Right. And, right. and, yeah. and gouging know, the private business. So we're kind of living it. in that middle. Yeah. No. And I promise, my, this is my last question, um, only because um, it's always been asked, and I think it's it's necessary to bring up every year. Um, and I've got to give uh, credit for always, uh, Jackie Perry's question, um, and that is about the relationship between the school department um, and the town regarding community services, because yep. we depend on school facilities to generate nine hundred and one thousand dollars worth of revenue and childcare. Yep. You know, professionally. Uh, you know, um, where, where do you think that is? Do you think that there's an imbalance in that relationship right now, or no? I mean, one, a school does not have the ability to raise revenue, yeah. and so um, for us, we probably pay the school over a hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue direct general transfer between busing, snacks, and and rentals, yeah. rental facilities. So we're we're probably one of their biggest 
revenue generators. Yeah, we, we do run the child care as an enterprise. Right. Uh, we're paying right. for the space we're using in the schools. Right. So and all the facilities. Revenue. We get a per square foot fee based on hours, two bills a year. Um, and so that is that's part of the calculation. Right. And then we pay the school department for that. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, we pay. Yeah, it's truly an enterprise. Last fund. year we paid almost thirty-three thousand dollars in child care rent. We're just able to make more revenue than what Correct. They are expensive. Right. No, where the, but where, yeah. where the real imbalance is in the town school real, uh, relationship is on the grounds maintenance yeah. side. Right. Uh, they're using to support all their programs, right. uh, fields and and facilities, yeah, indoor right. and out. Right. And our use of that is just as minuscule comparatively right. to support our programs. We're not complaining about that necessarily. Right. And we'll kind still of touch yeah. on that on the on the <coughs> CIP when we start talking yeah. about turf and track use levels, fee. I mean those type of things is we're maintaining, <coughs> but our use is minuscule compared to the cost yeah. that we're outlaying. So I mean I was reserved. Uh, not reserved. I was. Uh, question myself what to ask me because it gets us back to kind of the old yeah. days when and, and you asked last year versus I've gone through and did duties but I didn't assign money because it's interpretive of how much time and so look yes so that is definitely you know it's, it's so that relation yeah absolutely I appreciate the answer yeah I had a quick question just about the proposed half a position yes uh, yeah that, absolutely what, what is that what, what's the right so um the cost of that? yeah um so what we have proposed um after working through, we have a couple challenges right now, hiring part-time staff. And so when I first got here the year before, we had eight seasonals. Uh, the, next, the, first, the, the year I got here, we had five. Last year, we had three. Uh, this year, we had five candidates that applied through two processes. And so one of the things we had identified um, is that challenge, um, working with Mike Shaw on some of the same challenges. We have an existing position that's a shared position with Public Works where uh, employee A plows during the winter, an employee A does trash for us in the summer, and it's been a good working relationship. It gets two things done, doesn't overstaff. Um, and so we discussed how we would look at that to try to balance and keep a budget. So this pr position is a shared position with Public Works. Uh, the person would, he or she would work grounds for us during uh, half the year, and the other half they would fill a plow route for Mike. Um, so half of that cost is in his budget, half of it is in ours. Um, and again, it's the same fee structure where it's about a sixty-eight thousand dollar between the two of us. Sorry, sixty-five eight seven five between the two of us. I was a couple grand off. Where half of that's in our budget and half of that's in Mike. What I've done in this budget to kind of do offset that for us is that we've changed the way we've been working through our organics program, and that saves us money, improved our cultural practices. So in this budget, I've reallocated funds from the athletic, uh, organics line. And I've reallocated funds from the part-time line that we haven't been able to fill to offset our portion of this project. So even though we're getting a theoretically half a full timer, it's not a it's not an increase in our budget. So it, we've been able to lower the organics line based on the practices we've had. Last year we bought an aerator. Last year we brought a cedar. So we're being able to do that stuff internally to one save money and to be able to meet the policy as far as doing those cultural practices where we're not being able to put weed killer down we have like we have a issue with crabgrass and so we're putting corn gluten down and we're going to have to do it twice versus a product that would deal with it once that's the policy and so those are just time <coughs> and costly so we're reshifting those money into the shared position so there's reductions in organic line and part-time pay yep. to compensate for this full-time half of the full-time position <coughs> did i answer your question peter point. Mm -hmm. okay yeah sure Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I'm following your accounting convention here, but I know you're showing expenses and revenues and yep. costs with expenses positive and revenues negative. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did on this on the revenues. They're showed as a negative because that's how they show up in the bookkeeping. But on the percentage side, I just want to show a positive percentage so it didn't look like it was. So so in this chart, it shows, for example, um, for in generational, it's a million thirteen in expense. We make a, a million four in revenue. That's a $415,000 net. So we are 141% self-funded for that okay. division. Okay. Sure. Yep. Uh, I had a couple of other questions. Uh, one had to do with that. The intergenerational line, yep. which, uh, senior senior programs, yep. and uh, uh, I was kind of curious on these. Uh, I know you have a lot of programs, but um, how how broadly 
attended are they? I mean, I think of my mom who's 83, and yep. my cousin yep. Marie who's 83, and their friend Mrs. Welch who's 95, and they go on yep. anything available. Yep. So do you, is it a broad use of these things, or is it yep. just a handful of people that uh, no, it's are a, users? Yeah, no, I mean, there isn't one, uh, there is an increasing demand. Um, we have certain limities, limits. Our partnerships with Martin Point would be over a barrel if we didn't have that working relationship. We consistently turn people away for meals, um, because of just fire code limits as far as space. Um, you know, the, the increases that you see in... in um, in, in this intergenerational line, two of the major ones come from seniors. One is the increased use of transportation, that's trips going out, people being used, but also pickups as far as the local pickups uh, for folks, and then the amount of meals that we're serving um, is through that program. So it's, we made a change in our process last year based on our, our record, excuse me, our senior advisory board where uh, we now have a resident registration period where they get first dibs at registering and then non-residents come in the week later to register to make sure because the demand was so high and we started having um, I would say emotional debates in the lobby whether a resident should sign up before a non-resident so we implemented that policy so the demand is there and I think with the age of our population I think I heard a stat that there's one person in every household of Scarborough that's 55 and older so I think that that's going to be a growing trend um, for those and we're also presently right now one of your goals is to become AAR certified AARP certified two years ago we have obtained that and we've got a group working through how do we make Scarborough an age-friendly community so what the, what the, that's helpful thank you yeah. one follow-up question to that is I have I'm just tumbling some numbers we're looking at, you know 2020 proposed but for you know senior programs something like uh, you know, revenues of 49k, but costs of 130k. Absolutely. K. Yep. So that's not that wouldn't fall into a category of mine that I would call self-funded. So yep. is that is is this something you're taking a look at, or how do you feel about that? Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so that was one of the main reasons for combining it in a generational where philosophically. Um, We've been evaluating the fees. We've increased the fees to try to make a new neutral back. We've been kind of slowly increasing those, so it's not all of a sudden a program that we were not charging for bus transportation. Now we're charging another $30, and it becomes a fiscal. Um, so we have been analyzing prices, raising those accordingly. Uh, a non-resident pays a larger fee than a resident to try to offset the difference in taxation that we appropriate. Um, and we've also started... Um, doing events in town where we've established scholarships where people can then apply for a scholarship to offset need. So you'll see that at Summerfest when we do the bounce zone, net profits go to the scholarship. So we are trying to be able to offset some of those costs for folks if they feel like they're getting outpriced. And so I think that's kind of that philosophical, how fast do you want yeah, to go? Yeah, I, I think there's always been a philosophy that I'm aware of when it comes to the senior programs that it was never intended to be self-funded. Um, and, and maybe that's something we need yeah. to reevaluate and change. Yeah. There was a, a a long time, and, and it's still today, where we really want to have low barriers for entry. We want folks to avail themselves of the programs and services. And we've got a very active senior advisory board that uh, has many opinions about these matters. So I appreciate your open-mindedness yep. and how you're framing and reframing framing services yep. and where they ought to reside. And yep. I mean, both you and Tom, I think, are doing a great job yep. with that. So that's, that's uh, out of the box thinking that is encouraging. And I you know, can suggest that we try to uh, do that in other areas of the budget uh, as we go forward. Um, you know, one there was one other one that I had along with that. I know we're shifting some expenses back to the rightful owner and some yeah. of the things that belong. We think in a better place. Yeah. For example, the you know managing the parking down at the co-op. Cool. You know, yep. go back to public safety. So, yep. so you know, nice job on that, and, and to keep up the good work on that. A related question. I so you don't have. Uh, the uh, Oak Hill uh, project building, 29 Black Point Road anymore. That's in your budget. Yeah. yeah. And then also, uh, there's a, there's another one related to that. Uh, oh, my, the Trigen. Yep. The Trigen. So that's yep. also comes to Tom. Yeah, I mean, I put that budget together if you've got questions. So I do. Yes. Uh, and this is in the spirit of what do we do? What are we going to do as a town? What yep. are our core services? What are, what are the businesses, quote unquote, if you let me sure. use that term, that we want to be in? Mm -hmm. Providing special services, providing daycare, Absolutely. providing great uh, experience in our yep. schools. 
can we take a look at this? I mean, this is a uh, 29 Black Point Road, you know, some quick numbers, you know, 58,000 in rental income, expenses of 33,000, foregone taxes of who knows what, <coughs> I mean, break even, or we're running that as a loss. Do we really want to be a landlord? You know, that, and what's the, you know, can we at least get an appraisal on that building and uh, see what it's worth? And is that something we could use as an asset to get off our a balance sheet and into a place where we they may have a hole in an operating budget. So, if it were my company and it's not, uh, that's you know, if it were my business, that's the sort of stuff I'd be looking at. So, if that's not a question, it's just you know, mm -hmm. it's a, a bit of a Johnny one note on that. I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that, that was actually that was actually a question last year, yeah. And because yeah. I think we were looking at the <coughs> cap right, yeah, the capital cost, capital right? Coming and, coming and I think that's going to be. Out. Right, because I think that's going to be something we need to take back up because uh, Larissa and I went through and looked at how much we make, and I don't have those numbers there, I apologize, um, how much we make annually offsetting operational costs. It's going to come down to philosophically when we have to do a major overhaul. We will be doing this season as part of the, the proposed budget an analysis for the heating system. One of the big things that got pushed out in the CIP was, you know, we've got old piping and what do we do for the heating system? And that's a major expense. And so... Part of in this existing budget is to bring a neutral company in to be able to, you know, give us a new cost. What's the latest and greatest? Is it worth making that investment? Yeah, let, us, let us promise that before we make a sizable capital reinvestment that we have the answer to that question right. and, yeah. and have Let's, that decision yeah, made. That question. I think it's great that yeah. you're willing to do that. And on the TriGen, we've yeah. been asking for some time. There's a thing called, I don't know what the right term is, but an ROI. Yeah. What's been our return on that investment? You know, um, we're, we're paying fifty thousand dollars each year in maintenance. You know, what have we really uh, <clears throat> earned on that? Is it really delivering what we expected it would in terms of utility savings? And and, I'm, and I don't want to point fingers or anything, but if it's not if it's not producing, if it's not uh, yep. living up to our expectations, then we ought to make a tough call and, and take another path. We're still buying propane. What would it have been if we had done nothing? So these these are the kinds of things that. Uh, I think that when we did it at the time, we had strong ecological reasons for it, but you know, things changed and it didn't really develop as we, as we had hoped. No harm, no foul. Let's, uh, you know, let's take a hard look and see if we, you know, how we might approach similar questions like that in the future, how we might sure. deal with that. We the end of the Sorry. Sorry. We do receive payment in of taxes from okay. for that building. Great. They are. <clears throat> With respect to the TriGen, you're right. It, it uh, is not, and, and this is kind of a generalization, but the, the Energy Committee has asked the same questions for some time, and I think we're, we're now starting to get the data in front of them because uh, there's a complicated set of factors. Uh, though we have natural gas purchase that we need, we don't have electricity purchase. So all of that needs to be factored into that bottom line ROI. Uh, we do expect that we will... Uh, maximize its efficiency when it's connected to the public safety building. That's a decision that was made over a year ago in terms of a design. Um, and, and so it's really then will we see its maximum uh, potential for us. I, I know those are tough decisions. They are involve a lot of variables, and it's mm -hmm. a very changing landscape with energy costs and generation. So yep. um, Good question. not an easy question. But I think no, I appreciate these are the kinds of things that I'd like us to have an yep. honest dialogue about and be able to make tough choices so that maybe we get some flexibility in this budget where people may not see that today. Okay, good question. Thank you. Um, so if you don't, can I answer a question? Yes. Is, that, is there an expectation that that be delivered as part of this budget uh, message and as part of this budget deliberation? Because it seems to me that's a long, they may be more long range planning, long range being going into the next cycle. Great question. I don't know. I, mean, I believe there will be that. reports that are available uh, sooner than later on its uh, operation to date. Uh, I think it is a bit of a, a wait and see as we do connect it to the public safety building. But we can provide that in the interim. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And, yeah, and so just to, um, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, not to complicate this, but <coughs> I, I see the triad, personally, I see the triad question being something that can't be uh, solutioned. Um, or answered within this budget because Correct. of the benefit that it provides to the public safety building. Correct. However, I could see the question regarding ownership of the Black Point Road, uh, the old school, um, mm -hmm. as something that could impact this budget. So, um, you know, I, I kind of. Well, I, well there's no, just sorry, you want me to on the but There's no impact to this budget regarding Garland because we are profiting from the rental 
Well, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's the, it's, yeah, to your question, it's, it it's going to be the CIP decision when we start losing right. funds. And we right. do have an existing lease that needs to be sorted through. Um, but right. well, yeah. it's high time that yeah. we, mm -hmm. we bring it up. Absolutely. So, um, is, uh, so with 10 minutes left, technically, yep. of our, our regular meeting, um, Todd, are you all set? Any more questions? For yeah. 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 yeah, the yeah. capital was the only thing. I wasn't sure if okay. you... Um, <coughs> So, on Capital, just a quick yep. question. Yep. I noticed we break out the artificial turf and the track resurfacing. Yep. But I'm assuming both of those issues will be combined for a bonding issue? Correct. So even yep. The, yep. The they need to go hand in yeah. I just did it so you could see that it's yeah, two separate it'll, numbers. It will be a package deal so right. it's similar to the yep. whatever fire apparatus we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, two there's no, Absolutely. There's no debt service in here. Yep. And there'll be a process that we work through between now and the referendum because we're meeting with coaches and we'll have public meetings and then Great. decide on what it will be and then bring that forward as a community project through and referendum. The only other question, which we will take up later, but under your cap, you've got three really heavy hitters yep. for equipment. Yep. Um, you know, you've got a new dump truck, you've got yep. a new John Deere front mower, which I understand. Yep. But the rough mower sounds yep. like you've got apparatus that's working, it's not as convenient as maybe it should be because you've got to load it and unload it and yep. adjust height. Yep. Mm -hmm. But is there any way that that rough mower could be pushed a year? So that it comes <coughs> out of it and it's a $70,000 um, hit. Um, I think if. If it would be all right with you, I'd like to have that discussion with my my park staff. I don't know. We have, presently we have the 99 front mount that we do snow blowing and snow plowing. Um, I mean, uh, snow blowing and brushing, and then also mowing with. Um, and it 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 is on its last leg. The discussion we've been having around the rough cut mower is that um, with our staffing challenges, it does allow us to do multiple things. It's quicker. You know, presently we mow with a gang mower that you're running over the grass and then you're, you're mowing it behind you. This allows us to mow in front. But also in our organics program, it allows us to adjust the deck. It takes an hour back at the shop to adjust the height of a gang mower. Where, and what we're trying to do is reduce some of our costs. So with a new mower, you could be out in the field and mow it and adjust pins and be able to do a better and bring another piece of equipment with you. No, so. it's just, but it's the time involved. Oh, absolutely. Nope. And that's, so, I mean, so for us. Well, I do mean, recall the truck was pushed from last year. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, didn't I didn't question the truck. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And I think if there's a choice that. between the two, I think I'd like to, if, if that's the question you're asking or yeah. pushing one off, I'd like to identify that with staff because I think it's a manpower consideration. I think yeah. it's workload. I will bring back a report while you're still in deliberation. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We can. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Tom, it's six minutes. Yeah, I think I can do it. You have uh, <clears throat> I think I can do it. Presented with, um, I'll, I'll characterize it as, as the challenge of making some adjustments to the budget. You know, I certainly have given some thought. And the first order of the hierarchy of, of process, from my point of view, is to kind of look at uh, the things that do no harm to uh, level of service, and and I, I think the same would be said uh, at the school level as well. There are a number of things that this committee is well aware of that, uh, for years, frankly. Uh, Sean and Peter, you've talked about it every year, even part of finance in one form or another, around how we choose to, to, to fund things. Um, so this analysis that uh, is only perhaps part of the conversation, but I think maybe the easiest part, um, it's really the policy-driven components of uh, the budget requests, and they're kind of sprinkled throughout. But most of them do reside one way or another in the capital budget. So kind of the, the three areas that I, I bring to you for conversation and maybe consideration is first deferment of certain projects and capital I've scoured back through the, this the and all carpet is yeah and I'll take you to places where you'll see it unraveling uh, before our eyes but nonetheless we, we need we're aware of the challenge and um, yep. the same is said with the planning department renovation there's some there's some tremendous efficiencies uh, <coughs> not just for staff but for the public um, that we'd love to to gain there and there's a final one, which is a, the last phase of a drainage assessment, subsurface drainage assessment through Public Works that uh, we really do need to complete. But I think in the interest of our challenge, that's something we could defer. 
So uh, I sit here that I think that there's uh, at least three projects that we could push to a, a future uh, conversation. That's 132,000. The next category of uh, consideration would be uh, really shifting uh, how we choose to fund uh, other capital items. This year I was, uh, I took to heart, it was more aggressive than ever. And in fact, uh, it was more than $700,000 more in uh, capital projects to be appropriated this year than last, and that's certainly a budget driver. Mm -hmm. And so I've gone through and I've aggregated them here for simplicity. I do have details here, and, and I'm pleased to provide it to you. Um, <coughs> and this does not include all the things to be appropriated. There's, there's just some things that I couldn't bring myself to suggest that we should find some other method, you know, uh, outfitting classrooms or fairly low dollar amounts. They're just not good candidates, and I think, frankly, irresponsible for me to put them in front of you. But I think these all represent things that uh, could be considered. And keep in mind, when we say finance, it could be, and it very likely would be as short as three years in some cases, given the, uh, in, in most cases, no more than five years of these items. So if, the, <clears throat> if they shift back from appropriations to capital, mm -hmm. Are these net of sort of debt service charges or whatever that might be on it, or is that a small, I mean, it wouldn't be a lot of money if they're... Uh, we wouldn't see debt, debt costs related to this until the following year. Okay. Uh, so, so that's not really a so consideration this in, in this budget year. Direct budget I, I, I Maybe I'm stating the obvious, but when you're talking about financing something, something over, you know, two and three years, uh, those are big debt service payments. So, you know, no surprise, we'll see that in future debt service costs, as you, as you point out. Yeah. And the final piece, which again has been a point of some um, great conversation, is uh, the establishment of an equipment reserve account, such that we would have a reserve account to draw from uh, to fund future capital purchases. And we had proposed about $171,000 as a start. That was about, uh, I think, one-sixth of what we had identified was the need, which was about a million dollars. Um, and the question is whether this is the right year to do it. And so I, I offer those up as not easy decisions because I think they've been very well thought out. I think they're prudent financial decisions, but they are there are choice points uh, that you could make if you wished. Yeah. Below, and, and uh, I just put a couple of thoughts there for my own purposes, but it may help you as well. Uh, I believe there are a number of school capital items that potentially could be deferred. Uh, I was part of a neighborhood budget meeting and the superintendent mentioned the fact that the, her leadership team and the Board of Education will be having some meetings in the coming days. Um, and uh, there were some particular capital <coughs> items that were talked about that there seemed there's quite, quite likely to be some movement on. I can't tell you what those are, what those values are, but uh, I've been led to believe that there'll be some, there's something in motion there and you're likely to hear that when you meet back with them. So, so this is different than you put it, it was in appropriations are gonna move into capital. This is something that's in capital that they're now saying possibility or exploring deferring. Or another way to another way to approach it perhaps. And and again I that's that's all I know. And um, on that would there be a debt so would the impact of the budget be the debt service component? I don't know. My hunch is that all of those items uh, were programmed to be appropriated, so, uh, oh, okay. so I, they will have direct impact, yeah, yeah, uh, not debt service, but uh, yeah, direct but impact. That's why I was asking. Yep. I thought you picked up all those items, but you said there's some additional items that might be in appropriations that could be. Correct. Okay. And, and that's their, I say it's their choice. It's yeah. not my role to tell mm -hmm. them what to, to push. Um, the one exception uh, that I have dipped into the school side of things is just the financing of one of their vehicles, and that's typically a decision we've made. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they have any issue with that. The other area that uh, I characterize as policy-driven is our unfunded, uh, undesignated fund balance. That is a policy that we've created. I do not recommend that we look at that. I think we work very hard to be regimented and stay true to the purpose, and I, I think that's not something I would recommend you look at. The other things are revenue related. I've not done anything to look further at the revenue side. Um, you know, we were, I think, I won't say aggressive, but uh, again, we're, we increased excise. We've done that every year and it's outperformed. Oh, yeah. It has. Another uh, year, maybe? I, it's been probably three or four weeks since we ran the numbers. I, I think we will run those again to see how we might track at year end. And I can report back at your next meeting. The other one is main revenue sharing. Uh, 
<laughs> it had, the what are you looking at? <laughs> the current budget uh, calls for 2.5%, a half percent increase. Uh, it seems virtually certain that that is a solid number. Uh, I'm told that out of taxation committee, they actually voted to raise it to, to all the way to 5%, which would be significant good news for us. Um, also worth noting is the governor's uh, second year of the biennial budget, I believe, has it going to 3%. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some final horse trading, but of course there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so I, we should not be counting those chickens before they're hatched, but there could be some good news in the horizon. So far, uh, it's been good news. And I guess the last order would be to, to dig into the operating budget um, and, and find different adjustments uh, that you may wish to look there, uh, look for there. That's all I got. That's a lot. Six minutes. Thank you. Good, good job. Questions? Uh, only question I have, Sean, is have you thought about do we take action on anything on recommendation tonight on these to move the budget discussions forward? <coughs> or is this just something that is part of the conversation going forward? What sort of your thought? Sure. Um, so, uh, first Tom, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to clarify, because uh, the introduction of this, um, um, may have led somebody, some people who are watching to think that we might have uh, covered also the other departments that weren't covered. So I do want to at least cover that first, and then I'll answer your yeah, question. Yeah. So I want to, because we have several departments here that didn't get a chance to present, and I do want to say thank you to them. You know, library, SEDCO, our quasi um, departments in the sense that they're private, uh, they're managed by different boards, but also um, public works, IT, human resources, finance. Um, planning, um, and maybe one or two more. So I, I do want to say thank you very, very much. I think that what we did in this planning process was to simply state that, generally <coughs> speaking, those budgets um, don't make significant changes in their planning structure strategy um, and their increases. In fact, I was looking at a couple. Um, uh, one is uh, less than $6,000 change. One's less than 25. One's less than 15 or 12. So I want people to understand is that they are still very, very important um, in the scheme of the whole budget. Um, but we just chose, at least now, um, not to focus on that. But we want to say thank you very much because we know you did a lot of hard work to help the manager come in with the budget. Um, to the question regarding planning, <coughs> I would suggest that um, we not take any action on these this evening because I think that we need to have, um, as we've promised, to have a group conversation with our colleagues on the school board at the May 6th joint session so that we can understand the full scope of everything that we are doing and that we apply, hopefully apply um, the methodology um, evenly and equitably across the board so that it's uh, fair. Because um, I would think that if we apply one theory on the town side, that we might have some agreement and apply the same theory on the, I'm sorry, on the school side. It's their choice, but um, I think that we need to, just as a, um, as a cordial invite to them, I, I would prefer to wait um, to, to understand, especially because there are pieces in here that impact their budgets, and I'd like to hear, um, you know, particularly like the like the facilities vehicle, the school facilities vehicle, and, and whatever else might be their part. So um, I, I think that we could do it. That keep in mind for the public that, and I do have um, for um, it is out on the town's Facebook page, and I think the, I think on the website is there is a calendar of all of the meetings that are scheduled between now and Tuesday, June 11th, which is the validation vote. Um, and I want to mention that the public hearing for this, the budget um, is May 1st. Uh, keep in mind that is unadjusted based upon the initial first reading, um, at least um, whatever the outcome was at that meeting. There are two neighborhood budgets um, meetings, one May 2nd in the council chambers here, Thursday, May 2nd. The other one is um, May 4th at Wentworth. For some reason, I thought that May 4th was in this building, so I know. Is it Wentworth at 10, 10 a.m. Okay, and then that's my fault. Um, and then there is uh, May 6th, we did do the swap, uh, is going to be a joint town council and school board budget workshop. Uh, we did change that so that we could talk about it. And that's because on May 8th will be the town, this finance committee's final responsibility is to talk about these adjustments that have been recommended by the manager as well as any that have been presented or discussed at the joint session so that we can have a final recommendation to the council as a whole. And that meeting, by the way, um, on that date will start at 5.30 in council chambers, understanding that we have a hard stop at 7, because that is a council meeting night, correct? 
No, not on the eighth. Why am I getting that? Because oh, that's the second week of the month. Yeah, that yeah. is the second week. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. So, um, so we might be able to do a super session. I'm getting on my day. Sorry, I got too many calendars. <laughs> I'm trying to keep between council and legislature my own. Um, so. Um, that's kind of where I'm kind of thinking this through. I'd like to hear from the two of you. Yeah, I, I didn't know if we wanted to at least on the pieces that we had talked about, which is the equipment reserve, just whether, I don't know if we want to have the conversation here or as you suggest on, on the joint, is, you know, do, is this the right time to do that, that policy implementation? Should we wait? You're saying we'll do that at the joint work <coughs> Is your presence? Well, as far as the conversation around it, absolutely. Okay. And then, and then okay. the decision on the eighth. If you would like to do that this evening, then it's uh, no, no, that, um, yeah, no. I, I've just, put this out there, so it's going to be out there, and right. hopefully, it gives folks. I don't know if it's comfort, but at least uh, a sense that there are some paths forward. And that's some that's really forward. that's really what it was intended to serve. So, discuss it. There's just there's been so much discussed tonight that having this yeah. might be not fruitful. Um, and then the only other thing, yes. John, for the May eighth, where we're going to have the various department reviews as this group. I didn't know if we wanted to reserve any part of that. If we had any questions for some of the other departments that have that. not not to do a full presentation, but yeah. the town manager just really mm -hmm. maybe to address any sure. questions about departments that didn't come forward. Sure. If, I think for the purposes of tonight, if we can just, if you can send out an email to all of us, any, any of us, as well as Tom and yeah. staff, um, on what departments and maybe even what questions that we can cover. Yeah, I think any of them are pleased to be here. I just don't yeah, want to, I, I appreciate you got a lot to get through that evening. So if you have particular questions, yeah. make me aware if, and I should be able to Great. get the answer and provide it to you. Um, so with that, uh, what I would like to do is open up to public comment because uh, we do have one citizen and one town councilor. So I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Johnson, thank you for staying through that. Is there any questions that you have regarding the budget and then any comments after the questions that you would like to? Uh, no, I think you guys pretty much covered it. I think for Chief Thorough, Thorough well, excuse me, they, and can you, can you do me a favor? Uh, could you come to the table only? And yeah. Everybody else as well, only because I forgot. I'm pretty loud, I think. There is no, um, and these mics are on. This is an awkward. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, for, it's for the public. So okay, yeah, sure. If you want to take a yeah, seat. Come sit down there. It's more for the public. And you stated this pretty clearly, but I, I just wanted it to be said again. The four positions are, are that's, that's one person on duty essentially managing that facility, correct? That, yeah. those four new lieutenants. Which person playing the Correct. Cycle. Right. So when we talk four positions, and that's that's a twenty-four hour cycle of coverage. Correct. Correct. And uh, those four positions, the urgency of those is increased because we're going to be having a brand new facility, so your operations are changing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and then I think, like I said, you stated it pretty clearly. I just kind of wanted to restate it. And then I think my only other question with um, for Chief Moulton was the sixty-three percent of the shifts. That are at minimum service. Is he still here? Oh, yep, sir. Yep. Uh, see if I can ask this. What makes sense is it, you clearly have a down uh, slow shift, correct? Would that be the graveyard shift? What is a typical like? Is midnight to eight the slow shift? Uh, it can be. Depends on the yeah. depends on the season. Sure. And, uh, but yeah. So when you say sixty three percent, does that? Does that include? Yeah. The, do, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Does that include the slow shifts are lumped in there? Just they're weighted as equally as the, the busy shifts, so to speak. It includes all shifts. Okay. All right. Okay. That was my. Um, the, only, the, the only thing I would add to that is is that um, keep in mind that those shifts, like the midnight shift, which may be the slowest, can also be the most dangerous. Yep. Sure. You know, yeah. We have burglars. Right. We have. Uh, you know, different things going on. So you have a higher probability of a two-person call. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I have one comment as a member of the public, but I can. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, as someone who uh, works on a forty-nine thousand dollars a year salary, I would I would strongly urge the finance committee for next year uh, to keep the current cost of our summer programs as they are. And um, I think the town provides a service, and we do have increased costs due to the minimum wage, which it affects me personally as well. Um, but. I think our summer program is not cheap, and it is a financial strain on um, not just lower income people, but I think the majority of people that actually use the 
use those services. So that would be my one comment as a resident. So, thank you very much. Any citizen that would like to speak? Sir? No? Thank you, though, for coming. We appreciate it. And to the staff that's been here. Um, any closing remarks from, st uh, from council or from finance committee? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> <laughs> I almost stepped back and tried to get slapped.